and you can apply what you know and teach new new minds. New well, <coughs> Dave, <coughs> Dave Schwartz also was my first director in animation. And Dave, I always tell the story about when I walked, waltzed in there, <laughs> and you were like, hey, you're like, we can pay you a kill fee. <laughs> we got like, hey, what's that? <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> And, but thank God, you know, you guys were like, you know, it, it was, to, it was to your, to, it, it was to my benefit and it was your good graces that you guys let me work and let me do stuff and learn, you know, that was such a big, big thing. I can never thank you enough for that. Well, you know, I, I, when people kind of ask me, cause you know, what what most people know about the entertainment industry is all the cutthroat stories and and Len you'll I'm sure you'll agree with me there are plenty of those cutthroat stories lots of bodies buried scattered out well, in the desert press the people with aspirations <laughs> yes mm. Mm. But, but the thing I found about um, the artists uh, the the animation artists that I, I worked with what especially you know, when, when I got to Disney, and Di Disney was my second job in animation. I started out at, at Deek, you know, yeah. uh, which most people will say Deek stood for do it cheap. Mm -hmm. oh. and, um, and somehow, uh, you know, when the Disney afternoon took off and, you know, now they just needed, they needed bodies. They needed bodies to you know, crank out the episodes because we were, you know, we were doing 65 episode packages and with a September premiere date for, you know, one year after another. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if, if you even had an inkling of what storyboarding was, you know, they gave you a shot. Yeah. And when I got to Disney, um, I, you know, uh, and, and uh, Len, you remember, we were, we were kind of a small, little tucked away group. You know, we, we were in the Coanga building. We were all on the second floor. Uh, we just shared offices. The writers had their own offices. You know, all the nooks and crannies were filled with people. And everybody was very generous with their time in taking a look at things if I shoved them under their nose, what do you think? Uh, or answer questions, what, you know, wh why do you do that? You know, um, do, uh, Dave, do you know uh, Dave Smith? Yeah, oh, well, yeah, I know Okay, yeah. so Dave Smith drew in red pencil. Right. And why do, you, why do you work in red pencil? Well, that's what I like to draw in, you know? And, and years later, I, I started drawing in red pencil and it made me sense too. to me. Yeah, it made you sense know? to me too, yeah. Um, and and, and some, some of it was laziness because back then we were still drawing on paper yep. and red pencil Xeroxed black. Yeah. So if, you're, if, you, if you could do tight roughs, you could save right. yourself time by doing it all in red and then you only cleaned up what you had to. Yeah, um, but everybody was very generous. Uh, you know, uh, Alan was Zaslav. It lazy? It was smart, you know, that was smart. Yeah, it really was. Yeah, both, yeah, and then, was and then, uh, and then, I don't know if you remember, but but when, when you when you worked for me, I used to work on post its. Oh, sure, we all did. We all. Yeah. that was that was yeah. that was my first. That was the first indoctrination I got into how the process really worked. I had never worked in animation prior to that. So when I saw the post-it notes, that made perfect sense to me because you could flip everything, you know, it was easy. It was disposable. If you screwed up, you, ripped, you tore it off. Right. And, and they were also thin enough. They were like, they were really, yeah. the, the, the real post-its, the 3M post-its, not, not the, the knockoffs that the, the office supply places had, they were really smooth. They were like animation yeah. paper. They, it was really nice paper. So, yeah. you, could, so you could stack post-its and without even using a light box and yeah. see what's underneath there and do your multiple poses and then stick them down on a piece of paper. I still miss working. I miss working on that stuff. I loved working on post-it notes. I, me too. When, when they started converting from uh, doing uh, paper to digital, you know, and obviously they were, uh, the, the companies were still refining the software. And uh, so people, uh, some of the other artists that were working digitally would go, well, see, you, you draw here and then you, you, you lasso it, and you drag it, and you click it. And, it, and I go, at, I said, you know, it took you five minutes to do all that. If you give me a pencil and a pad of post-its, <laughs> I can bang out about 10, 10 things in the time yeah. it takes you to do one. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. All right, Len's sitting here. I'm going to Hold, hold on, because I want to get back to what you were saying about having mentors and people talking oh, absolutely. and helping you. So hold that thought. Len, yeah. introduce yourself to everybody who you are. Um, my name is Len Uli, and uh, I am a uh, 
veteran of 30, more than 30 years in writing animation, but I had another 10 years before that as a precocious sitcom writer. I started out, I had my first sale when I was a junior in college uh, on a show no one remembers called Homes and Yo-Yo. It was on I remember that. For about 12 seconds. <laughs> I remember uh, that. <laughs> and that was my first gig. And then in my senior year of college, I had a TV series format optioned uh, it was, uh, you know, a ridiculous idea. It was about the first black president of the United States. It was in 1977, so it was a bit ahead of its time. Uh, then I went off to film school, and uh, I, ex excuse me, that was during film school, then graduated and, you know, bumped around, got a few assignments here and there, and then um, accidentally was introduced to the animation business, and uh, the the first gig I had was at Disney in animation and that was on the gummy bears <laughs> and uh, I did one freelance gummy bears episode one freelance ducktales and that was just as the ducktales transitioning into Disney afternoon began mm -hmm. and so I spent five and a half years at Disney TV animation and uh, then left doing the funny animal business and went on to doing superhero stuff. And I have bounced around between comedy and action and preschool and Bible adventure series and pretty much, you know, you name it, uh, I've been doing it for the last umpty years. I'm currently writing my first video game. And that's a whole different set of muscles and that's terribly exciting. That is fun. So, uh, still fun. at it uh, because, yeah. you know, uh, basically- What else are you gonna do? Uh, well. You know, you can retire. Uh, unlike you guys, I stopped drawing in 1970, so nobody wants to see anything I do with a pencil. <laughs> but I can still write stuff, you know, so that all works out. Yeah, you know what I mean, but you know, my God, the career that you the that you've had and you continue to have, you know, we we work together on Static Shock. We, uh -huh. you know, and and that was a great, you know, that was a great uh, time. I loved working with you because. You were one of the one of the few writers who were always Warner's was very good for this. I shouldn't say few, like, but at Warner's, the writers were always very open to collaboration and working with the artist. And I agree. I agree. I, I think in terms of, you know, most of my work has been freelance. So, you know, you sit at home, you don't have a whole lot of interaction. But during the time at Warner Brothers, we really got a sense that we could all you know, just get together and look at each other's stuff. And if a board artist had a question of what the heck were you doing with that, you know, action in the script, we could talk about it. I could look at the boards. There was a lot more crosstalk. Uh, sometimes that was the case prior to that at Disney. I mean, I should say, first I was at Disney mm -hmm. and then I was either freelancer or on staff at, at Warner Brothers many years after that, when you and I, uh, Dave Klistik, uh, were working mm -hmm. on Static. Um, but the, the sometimes there were directors with whom I worked, you know, fairly closely and had a great collaboration at Disney, but I, I got this, you know, like, like Dave Block, for example. Uh, but there were other times where, and, you know, and you mentioned Alan Zaslav, uh, he's a lovely man, and he did, he was always welcoming, Bob Hathcock, terrific. Uh, but I got more of a sense that we could all sort of get together in the same room when we were at um, when we were at Warner Brothers, and that, that I do miss that tremendously. That was a real sense of everybody on the same team at the same time, kind of thing, you know. Yeah. And that that's yeah. that's. Stupid. I mean, you know, on the other hand, Dave Schwartz and I uh, turns out we did we worked together on a lot of stuff. I, I looked it up, Dave. Excuse me for <laughs> looking near IMDb Pro, but yeah, we worked on um, the most the most recent credit I looked up. Uh, I wrote the teleplay for Scooby Doo and the Spooky Scarecrow, and you worked on that apparently. Ah, uh, yes, I did. I, I, I worked on a lot of Scooby. Yeah, but and we we also worked on the short subject. Now, Dave, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but when we were ramping up on Bonkers in a big ugly hurry, yeah, we also did a short subject called Pedal to the Metal. Right. Excuse me, Pedal to the Metal, which was a short subject for theatrical release. Right. And it was. Dave Block directed it, and uh, Dave Schwartz was a board artist on it, and it was animated 
by the French studio that they owned at the time. And it was so good looking. Oh my gosh, it was really the best thing to come out of there in a long time. So that was, that was amazing to have that kind of good product. And Dave Schwartz and I worked on Bonkers and um, also Plunder and Lightning. And I'm gonna tell you a, a funny story about that. Uh, Plunder and Lightning, the first miniseries episode of, of Tailspin. Uh -huh. You never know when, this is important for everybody to keep in mind. You never know when a credit will come back and help you. Uh -huh. Because this video game that I'm working on, the guys that contacted me last year to begin work on it, and I've been on it since, on and off, they were fans of Tailspin, and they wanted one of those guys that could write <laughs> funny dialogue for Don Carnage. Uh -huh. So I got the gig 30-some years later Wow! because those people grew up watching the shows that you and, yes. I, and, oh. and I worked on. <laughs> There's so, so many I, people then that, you know, when I teach and they're like, oh, you direct, I love Static. That was my favorite show when I was a kid. Or you yeah. worked on Batman or you worked on, you know, Jackie Chan. And the weird thing to me is, is it doesn't feel like it was that long ago. <laughs> like, yeah, oh, but, yeah. but I looked it is, the calendar. Yeah. It was a long time yeah, ago. Long time. It was really a long time ago. Yeah, but, so. you know, people remembered it and, and People are, I mean, when we go to conventions still, and you know, I, like I do an X-Men panel with Eric and Julia Leewald, stuff like that, and Larry Houston, or, you know, we, we, you know, do other stuff and people walk up and they say, this was important to them. To us, it's like, yeah, well, that was a job and we enjoyed yeah. doing it and all that, but it really matters to people. And that's, it's humbling and heartening yeah. to hear how much people appreciate the stuff that we did umpty jillion years ago. Well, you think about it. Really love the, the students. My, my students uh, usually will go to the, my IMDB page to see, you know, your to, creds, to man. To check, to check out my street Sorry. cred, you oh, know, yeah. and the first thing they say when, you know, the first day of class is, you know, you're my childhood. That's yeah. the phrase. You know, and that's oh. really, uh, I mean, I, I always enjoyed working on the shows, but it, I mean, I'm, I'm in one on one hand it, it, it was a job um yeah. but you know i always said it it's it was a it was a fun job yeah. um it was probably the best job i ever had where i didn't have to do any heavy lifting well, sure yeah, yeah and, and how many millions of people you know saw the work that we did and it's funny because we think it's a small group because we're working together and we're working on stuff so it's you know it's hey dave it's dave schwartz it's len yuli you know you see, you, you don't realize, like that small group of people, how many millions of people we've reached with the work that we've done. And or around the world, you know. <laughs> right, right. I get, I'll right. get, you know, every once in a while, I'll still get like a little residual check from, uh, from when I di directed Jumanji and it's some little yeah. tucked away country that I didn't even know existed, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean, I get, I get my quarter. Yeah, like quarter yeah, residual, yeah. you know, sure. from space monkeys or something like that, but, you know, but, yeah. uh, but, yeah. you know, you still kind of go, well, you know, Hey, I, I did that. Yeah. It's, good. yeah it, it's absolutely, it's incredible to me. It's a, it's an, you know, how many people that we've, you know, touched their lives, you know, these kids and everything that grew up with the work that we've done over the years. And, you know, yeah. it's, uh, We're very fortunate. it is absolutely an unbelievable thing. It's very humbling to, to for yeah. sure. Uh, I, I see him in the background over here, Vic Delcelli's. Uh, My buddy, yeah, Vic Delcelli. I haven't seen in a long time. Hey, Vic. Hey, how you hey. Doing? hi. How you doing? Good to All see right. you. It's good we to always see get... both of you. Hmm. You know, Vic. Now, Vic <laughs> Delcelli was a bit of a mentor for me because <laughs> when I was trying to break in, was it? Was it? A, I met you at Deke, didn't I? Uh, yeah, Vic? we met at Deke. Yes. Right, and 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 Vic was always nice enough to feed me like a little section of the board he was working on because I was really antsy pantsy to to move from cleanup and revision and get into storyboarding, and uh, uh, so he was always nice enough to kind of, you know, here's a little do this little sequence, and you know, <laughs> from his section, so. Uh, you know, I have to say thank you for that. You, you, you gave me, you helped me have my career. All right, Vic. Now I, you have I to tell. Have, I, I, I wouldn't have done it uh, unless I saw a, a lot of talent and ability. Uh, oh. So that was that's why I gave him stuff because he was really, uh, really good. 
Well, and yeah. and Vic was a really he was a really nice guy. I mean, he was very patient, and um, but but just a very sweet guy. And he, he's always you know when whenever whenever I see him, and I, I know I I back when I lived in L.A. I used to see a little more often, and then I think the last time we saw each other was at uh, the Cartoon Network. Uh, you Could were, been, at, yeah. yeah, I, I think you were trying to get Conan up and running or whatever. And, uh, yeah. I was working yeah. on the, uh, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the Andre, uh, of Andre the, the, 3000. Yeah. Andre 3000 show. Uh, and so oh. we kind of, we kind of sat across the aisle. He was in one cubicle and I was in the other, but, uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's nice to see you again, Vic. And, and I, you know, thanks, nice thanks again. You. Vic, you have to tell everybody who you are now since you since you popped in here. So <laughs> well, I don't, it's always nice I don't to get. I don't remember who I am anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, try to remember what you try to remember. Some of come on, you got to tell everybody who you are and what some of the stuff that you've done. It's impressive. Well, okay, <clears throat> I've been a, a storyboard artist. I've also directed and produced. Uh, I started on. Um, Good Lord, I started on some show called Shazam and then uh, went on to do the first He-Mans. Then I went on to do She-Ra. And, uh, and after that, I think it went over to Marvel and, and did the first Transformers and the second G.I. Joe miniseries. And then I went to Deke. And I think I did the, a show there. I guess it's the only one that got renewed in their first uh, year of existence. It was called Kid Video. But since I've gone, I went back to, to Filmation and then I bounced around. I've also, uh, you know, done a 40 hour week and then another 40 hour week when I got home <laughs> on two different, for, for, <laughs> for two yeah. different studios. Back in the day when you could actually, I guess, do that because there wasn't as much drawing needed. You yeah. know, you would do like well, 330 panels to do an act. Yeah. Instead of a that, instead of a thousand or eight hundred, what it is now, yeah. and um, after that, I you know I worked on. Uh, good Lord, I've forgotten half the stuff. It just well, I well, we memorize it. We worked together on <laughs> Alf and Alf Tales, right? Oh, and, and, yeah. And I think I was on something else while you were on Alf Tales because we were all that. You know, we had all those bullpens for each. Well, yeah. So when I came in, uh, that group was working on Kissifer. Yeah, that's right. I was on Kissifer with you. Right. And then and then we all kind of moved into uh, Alpha and Alpha Tales, which was on NBC uh, Saturday mornings. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I still get a lot of reaction out of that, too. And I'd like to also oh. point out that I see here that, yeah. that Vic worked on uh, a series that some of us have been trying to forget called Skeleton Warriors. And <laughs> yes, uh, that was great. It was yeah. it was titles. The titles were fantastic. Yeah, the, and there was thirteen was episodes of show. off model. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we uh, also worked. I I started in some episodes of RoboCop that he directed and produced. And I'm just looking here, uh, Vic. I'm sorry. I'm going to be your publicist for a second. Uh, you directed a number of static shocks, including uh, a couple that I had written. Uh, That's and, right. And uh, I see that you had a bunch of Ozzy and Drix uh, credits. And I'd like to point out that one of them uh, mm -hmm. was Where, Where There's Smoke, an episode that I wrote that was a, uh, an anti-smoking screed that <laughs> yeah. not only got us a, uh, some kind of an award, but also had a song that I got to co-write, which had uh, uh, Tim Curry as the villain. Oh, Tim wow. Curry was the villain, Nicotine, inside the <laughs> kid's body that nice. Ozzy and Drix were fighting. Uh, and he, he I, so I got to write for, for you know, Franken, Frankenfurter. So I was Frankenfurter. Pretty, yeah. yeah, so that was yeah. me. So, you know, cool. our, all of our paths cross. That's the thing, it's a strange, yeah. Yeah. small, business mm -hmm. and yeah, it really work, is you know working on some <clears throat> things and maybe we don't even we're not in the same room even but you know no. it all works out <laughs> somehow yeah yes yeah well yeah. it's always i think it's a bonding thing like you've worked you know it's everybody knows how much work it takes how much effort it takes and the, and everybody's kind of gone through the whole 
I think everybody has had similar experiences if you've had a long enough career. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that bonds everybody, you know, it's a common thing. It's a common thread that goes through everybody's lives. Uh, well, you know, the thing that was kind of nice uh, back uh, uh, in the, uh, in, in the Disney and, and the Warner brothers days was that the, the, the writers were on staff too. Uh-huh. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, um, there were times when you could, you know, ask him a question or if you had an idea, you know, that you could go by and say, hey, look, I'm thinking of this. I you know, just want to make sure it doesn't pull focus from the story. Or there were times like I uh, one time I, I burst into uh, Dev Ross's office going, what were you thinking when you wrote that? <laughs> All full of <laughs> all full of fire, you know. I I, probably, I I was probably only there for about a month and a half, and already I was shooting my trap off, and and of course that moment is what you know kind of bonded Dev and I. You know, we still you know talk and work together uh, uh, after all these years, but but it was nice because and and what was nice for me was that because I had access to the writers because I was interested in writing. Um, I not only had art mentors, I had writing mentors. I had, I had people that I could go to and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm working up this pitch for, for an idea for a show. What do you think? Uh, right. Or, uh, you know, uh, back in those days, if you had a good enough idea and you were, you were friendly with the story editor, maybe they would let you write the script. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I was lucky enough to write a couple things at, at Disney when I was there. Um, just because uh, um, uh, uh, the 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 story went on Little Mermaid, uh, Ted and Patsy. Uh, oh yeah. And asked, you know, and and they liked the pitches that I had written with. I had a partner uh, at the time, and they liked their pitches, so they we we wrote one, and actually we were kind of moving into writing another one, uh, and then all of a sudden people started getting nervous that the artist wanted to write and. You know, so oh, yeah. there's that, always there, there's <laughs> always a corporate thing. You know, uh, I mentioned that you know got to write a song uh, for Ozzy and Drix, but I, I do remember at one point uh, the folk the the people uh, at Disney decided that the writers couldn't write songs anymore because they didn't want us to get ASCAP or BMI royalties. Oh, that's right. Uh, well, yeah. back so back in the for. Uh, uh, Around 1999, year 2000, I was at Cartoon Network working on seasons two and three of Johnny Bravo. Okay, ah. good show, great. Show. And and that that probably that was one of the best gigs that I had because uh, it it was we we did that cartoon the way they used to do old cartoons where the artists would story sketch out the ideas. You know, we would write we would write the cartoon uh, in drawings. Yeah. And then the writers would come in and kind of help. I mean, they'd come in with the idea and then we'd work with the writers and, and we'd try to outdo each other. Yeah. And so it, so it was a day of just laughing our guts out for, uh, you know, but by the time 4.30 rolled around, we had, we pretty much had the foundation of a 16 and a half minute cartoon. And, and that's what makes, and, and that's what's fun. That's what makes yeah. it great, you know. So, but we had a tendency, I mean, I always had a tendency to attempt to sneak myself into episodes. And so, that was uh, you. Yeah. And, <laughs> well, you're so, uh, I I I wound up in episodes of uh, uh, Johnny Bravo until the Cartoon Network said the artists have to stop drawing themselves in there because they didn't want us to become characters that they would have to pay. Oh. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. If they made a toy, if they made a toy, you'd, you'd be demanding millions of dollars. Yeah, right. you know. But uh, I wound up. No, uh, they, they never wanted to do that. <laughs> uh, I, I wound up in, uh, actually, I wound up in a Flintstones Christmas movie. Um, I, I wound up in an episode of Lilo and Stitch and 101 Dalmatians, you know, at the time, stupid me, I never thought of grabbing the a cell of my appearances so I could just, you know, have, have a whole rogues gallery there. So, you well, know. The, the yeah. most famous and most successful uh, staff person who became a cartoon character was the late Bruce Talkington who became yes. Nimno yes. on, um, <laughs> on, on uh, in Rescue Rangers. Uh -huh. And then you see a drawing of Bruce Talkington, yes. a, a drawing of, of 
Professor Nimnal, Nimnal. and you see a photo of Bruce talking. It was and, exactly him. Oh my God, that's him. Yeah, yeah. He absolutely. Was an exact character, oh. and it was a hilarious character, of course. Uh, but uh, it was just like, oh well, there's there's uh, his his bit of immortality. The only other guy that I knew that made reg such regular appearances is, uh, I, I, you, you know, uh, Eddie Fitzgerald. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Eddie Eddie showed up in a lot of things, uh, especially you know when he was working with with Chris Valusi uh, over at, uh, you know, like uh, uh, when I, I met him uh, on Beanie and Cecil when they were trying to redo Beanie and Cecil at Deke, and then uh, when uh, John was doing uh, Ren and Stimpy, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a question from yeah. from Arthur. We I the, there's Arthur, a where uh, are you? Arthur. <laughs> are there other we, people here? Arthur, yes, there are oh other people God. here. There's a bunch of people here. We've so, got a checkerboard galore. So we I'll take Paul Linda Block, please. <laughs> <laughs> so Arthur is actually from uh, Brazil, right? Arthur, uh, you you can it, it, he he wants to know what's the hardest part of writing a story. And do you have a creative process for it? Um, do you want me to answer? Yeah, go ahead. Well, you're, you're the main writer there, Len. Okay. So you can take um, a swing at that first. Well, Arthur, uh, the the thing about writing is writing for a living. I don't mean waiting for the muse to strike, but it's it is a job, and you have to have a routine. And everybody's is different, but for me at least, I have to sort of get to the desk by a certain time and treat it like, you know, punching a clock and getting through it because otherwise you can, you know, you can fritter away a lot of time. Everybody has their moments of not wanting, you know, to write on a particular day, but day in and day out, you really just have to sit your butt down and do the darn thing. Yeah. Now, if you're asking um, the creative process, it depends on what it is you're writing. If you're trying to create your own television series and you're building a, a series Bible and a pilot script and a actor wish list and, you know, all that sort of stuff and uh, representational art, that's one thing and that can take however long it takes. If you're writing an episode of a television series, it can go one of several ways, but the most common thing is if, if I'm like, if I'm on staff and I'm working for a story editor, let's say or if I'm freelancing and working for a story editor. Either I will come up with a bunch of series of episode premises and pitch those either verbally or on paper, depending on the situation you're in. Or they in turn will say, we need a story about thus and such. Sometimes the story editor or the writer producer will have worked out alone or in tandem with other writers, the entire arc of the season. And that's increasingly the case now when things are a little more serialized. When you're doing that kind of stuff, you're sort of brought in, they present you with the premise, and then you have a story break. That is to say, you sit down with them at a whiteboard or whatever it is, however you visualize the story, and you work out every single beat of that story. And then you, the freelance writer or the staff writer, go back to your home or go back to your office if you're on staff, which isn't often the case any longer, but anyway, you go and you go and build this story out of those notes. And then you present it to the story editor, your boss, and that person in turn gives you notes. And then you maybe do another pass or two. And then that is submitted to the powers that be, production company, studio, whomever. And those people in turn give notes. And then it's the round robin until you end up okay, the story's right, go on and you write a script and you write the script and do a draft of that and another draft of that. And then the story editor goes and does his or her magic to it. And then that's the one that goes into the network. And then it gets handed off to talented people like this and they turn it into something visual and wonderful. Uh, does that sort of cover it? I Dave? think so. Dave, you have any thoughts? Hey, Lynn, uh, I, I wanted to ask you a question. So sure. are you are you a... Um, are you an outliner and a planner? Absolutely. Down to, the, but down to the wire, or are you a by the seat of the pants kind of guy? Oh, uh, no, no, that's a good way to get stuck uh, in the middle of act two. Um, basically, especially in the television stuff, because everything has to be so thoroughly thought out. Yeah. Um, 
oftentimes, if, if I write up or I am given a premise, I then do a beat sheet, which is just a series of small sort of little bits, uh, small paragraphs describing each scene. Then that in turn becomes a proper story outline which is, you know, a prose thing. And depending on the show, that can run anywhere between, you know, three to five pages, single space, all the way to 10 pages, and then uh, away you go. Yeah. Then the script becomes, you know, back when these gentlemen and I were working, we were, you know, especially in the early days of Disney TV animation, those scripts were 40 some pages long. These days, we're being told to write scripts 25 to 28 pages long. That's the full script, not the outline. So things are a lot more compressed. Yeah. They, on one side, they say, well, that's to give the artists more leeway to do their magic. On the other side, it's because they want to put in space for more commercials. So it just depends <laughs> on the, yeah. which story you believe. Well, also uh, with Disney, they, they wanted you to be very thorough. Oh, yeah. Because, well, they, want, because they wanted to be sure that the kids heard it, saw it, and then heard it one more time so they didn't miss any story moments. So, right. you know, we were doing 43, pa 43, 47 page scripts for 22 minutes and over at Warner Brothers, those, the, the Batman guys, or the Tiny Toon guys, were working on 23 pages mm -hmm. and leaving lots of space for the artist to actually kind of do some of the writing. Right, to do the, the creative process. And that, yeah. and again, because you had that much more integrated work environment when you're on staff at Warner Brothers, yeah. you could do that and there could be some crosstalk that allowed right. you to work off of one another and build something wonderful. Yeah. Uh, the more compartmental studios, they were less inclined to do that. And early on, when we were doing those long, long scripts, that's when the writing style was more shot for shot. You were actually doing, calling out um, angles in a yeah. script which is in a live action script, they would pitch your script across the room right. because nobody wants to see you directing on paper. But at the time that was the style. Now it's much more master scene scripts and you're only obliged to give the smallest amount of stage direction, unless there's something that you are absolutely sure is essential yeah. that you want to describe in a, in a, uh, in a very visual way in the script. Uh, I, it, it may have been on, on one of the uh, uh, Vic scripts, I, I'm not sure, but there was one script in a static shock where I just um, tried to write it in uh, the style of, um, oh, what was his name? William Goldman. And you know, <laughs> long run, run on sentences and just, you know, breathless kind of description. And I think, it, it worked, but I don't recommend that kind of, you know, um, everything but your kitchen sink kind of writing yeah. generally, because you yeah. actually want to be a little more concrete, but it was a, a moment of, uh, of um, you know, brief poetry. And the rest of it is just, you know, getting the shot down so you can get onto the next chunk of dialogue or action or whatever the heck. Yep. I have a ton of questions that people are asking. So you guys want to take, take ooh, a ooh, crack ooh. at some of this? <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, let's see here. I'm not going to hit everybody. We're going to hit some. So, um, Stephanie asks, how do you approach serialized fiction with season long or longer plots? We've all heard of the three arc structure, but how does that apply when you've got the individual stories or episodes that feed into a larger series story? Uh, okay. Uh, again, that's the sort of thing where you have, for example, um, when you're doing a series that is serialized, yes, there is a three act structure in each episode, but you also have a much bigger sort of uh, 13 episode or 10 episode or whatever the, the, the order is that you, you're trying to convey a much larger story. So there, there's a much more uh, uh, work, detail work done, usually by the showrunner, producer, story editor, where you are trying to figure out where you're dropping little hints, breadcrumbs along the way in each episode. And you have to have that big picture that those guys and gals have. Uh, when you think of what uh, Eric Lewald did on the original X-Men series, 
uh, uh, more recent level uh, and any pretty much any Greg Weissman series. Yeah. Greg is is a real world builder. He does this really intricate storytelling where things are you know woven through episode after episode after episode, all with you know a, a destination in mind. Uh, I worked with a guy named Rob Hoagie. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever worked with Rob. Mm, Terrific, sharp producer. And he, um, among the shows he's worked on, he did Teen Titans and things like that, but he also did a show called Thunderbirds Are Go. And oh. if anybody has an Amazon Prime um, subscription, uh -huh. watch this show. It is the most beautiful thing you will ever see. Feature quality animation done by Peter Jackson's company, TV division of his company down in New Zealand. CG characters in practical sets. It's a reboot of a of a puppet series. Mm -hmm. I remember the old oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The original. Series, yeah. But sure. this is the most beautiful thing. And you know, <laughs> Rob did this extraordinary job of doing these, I don't know, whatever it is, 40 some episodes, maybe more, uh, leading up to a superb denouement with all of the characters and find their characters finding their dad and all that stuff. But some of them would be standalone episodes and some of them would speak to the bigger plot. And the, the, this kind of thinking is really, I mean, you see a lot of it in live action now, uh, but when we see it in animation, it's very, it's, it's hard to pull off well, but when it's done right, it's so satisfying for the storytellers and for the audience because they're really, really engaged. Well, the first time I saw that, um... Well, actually, like, like I, I guess you could say a, a season is, a, is, is almost like a three-act. It's just a bigger version of three-act uh, uh, structure. Yes. Uh, and Joss Whedon, you know, his uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer was, uh, and, and Angel, those were the first two shows that I saw where he did a season-long arc with smaller stories that all – when the sum total led to the last two episodes of the season to wrap, kind of wrap the whole thing up. Yep, yep. Uh, Greg did that in Gargoyles. Greg Wiseman did that with Gargoyles. He brought that to, and uh, um, I, that's, what he's, that's what he's doing now with the various iterations of Young Justice. Right. You know, right. it's very sharp writing. It's a, a different kind of storytelling than the kind of stuff that, you know, we were doing a Disney TV animation, yeah. for example, where it was, most episodes were everybody after the treasure, which yeah. is fine. I'm yeah. not knocking it, yeah. but it, it was a different kind of storytelling. Each were, story was self-contained. Right, unless right. we were doing the miniseries like with Plunder and Lightning that you and right. I worked on, yeah, or yeah. you know the, the, the miniseries that would launch a season or Become the pilot, yeah. Yeah, but most of the time there, there was no part one, two, three, four, five that we see now much more, more frequently. Well, Dave, I would, I would, or Vic, either one of you guys, like, you know, from a directing standpoint and from a visual standpoint, what, you know, I know from myself working on shows that have arcs and have, um, you know, the things that have a continuity going through that we have to approach it visually a certain way. Do you guys want to speak to that at all? Is there anything that you want to talk to about that process? Well, I know that um, when uh, I, I generally had, a very specific idea of of what kind of visual and subtextual story I was going to tell, uh, e whether it was just within the episode, like in uh, Space Monkeys, you know, mm. uh, or something that was going to stretch out over a couple of uh, of episodes. Um, so I know I was able to sit down with with the design team and 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 discuss it and let them know what I planned on doing so mm -hmm. that as they kind of began doing their visual development, that they, hopefully they were seeing what I was seeing so that their interpretation uh, would lend itself so that I would get the effects that I was, I was going to go for. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, again, I, I always tried to talk to the writers, uh, uh, writer, yeah. writers, just to find out, uh, what, what, if I, if I didn't know exactly what the arc was going to be, just to you know, get a clear picture so that my decisions were informed. Um, and then, and then just being sure that, you know, you're communicating with your crew, um, you know, so everybody's on the same page. It's, I mean, it's, I know at Marvel, you know, we, we, the writers really weren't there. I mean, they weren't on staff, so it was, 
but the but Marcia Griffith, who was what you know the lead, I guess this I guess she would be this I don't know I don't know if she's a story editor, or, but I guess she functioned in that capacity. She was there, and we would talk quite a bit about some of the serial you know some of the aspects, especially towards the end um, on Marvel Rising um, when I was when I was there. We did a show called Marvel Rising, and it was always there were a lot of visual things that they wanted characters to act certain ways or certain vis you know visual cues very Miyazaki, uh, not Miyazaki um Kurosawa yeah. in the sense that you know you give them a visual tick or something that that mm -hmm. kind of or if a character is hurt that it played off into the next whatever mini thing that we were doing like it wasn't just you know there were ramifications of it so that was one of the first shows that kind of Spider-Man did it as well it had uh -huh. an arc to it so there were, you know, that the, the character, there was, there was a whole arc of Doc Ock taking over Spider-Man's um, body, and taking over, you know, uh, his, his, and that arc ran pretty much throughout the entire season. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you, you, but each episode had its own self-contained story, but it also, there was the subplot that would keep going for, you know, further and further along. Yeah. I mean, did you work on Justice League Unlimited, Dave? Did you work on that at all? I, I didn't. Um, I I worked. Uh, well, I, I worked on uh, uh, Batman: Brave and the Bold. Okay. But I was I was working on a couple other things uh, at Warner's. I think well, probably uh, Scooby Doo. You know, I was there yeah. a long time with with all the you know with Scooby Doo. Yeah, all those but, iterations. I mean, Mister Incorporated was exactly yes. what we're talking about yes. because um, uh, it, it it was. Uh, a uh, you know individual episodes, but there were little breadcrumbs that were going to that was going to add up to the end of the se of the series when uh, a, the 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 bigger the bigger mystery was going to be revealed. That's my absolute favorite Scooby Doo. I, I worked on some of those episodes. I love the designs and I love the stories. I thought they were really well done. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. I loved doing that. Yeah, those are really well crafted uh, things. Vic, is there anything you wanted to add to that? What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, is um, if you, it, it, episodic writing, and, and my, I guess the question I had, when you're overseeing a series as a producer, you know, mm. you're overseeing, there's, I, I wanted to know, not just from the writing standpoint, but from a, you know, from a visual standpoint, what were some of the approaches that you took if you were like, you know, you developed plenty of things. So you had to kind of see it the really big picture, not just, you know, individual episodes. You had to see it as a series and how, how things went. So were there specific things that you focused on to make sure continuity was being followed with, uh, with you know, with, with, with context of the character and things of that nature? Were there any things that you, you know, what were you focused on with that, with that process? Uh, my main focus was... was uh writers uh, I didn't determine any of the stories or if there was going to be a story arc or anything and in the things that I've directed for sure and produced maybe only once uh, but uh, my focus was making sure that you know everybody had gotten the style that I wanted uh, background designers didn't do their own thing they needed to follow the, the established style stories um i tried to make sure that the board artists because there was usually three uh read the entire script so they knew what they were setting up if they didn't do the third act mm -hmm. so that they would you know uh yep. not not make the second act more dramatic than the third act uh, <laughs> yeah. or first act. <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. um so there's stuff like you know doing stuff like that but basically i don't remember ever really collaborating that much with the story editors or the, or the writers, uh, but. Still great advice. Yeah. So, all right, I'm gonna, and another question. What, um, let's see here from Jade. What is some advice you would give for creating compelling conflict that raises the stakes throughout the film or TV episode? All right, Len, what do you do to up the ante? Um, well, again, it depends on what kind of writing you're doing. If you are writing a three act or teaser, three acts and a tag, whatever it's structured, 
you know, you are obligated to follow the format of the series to some extent. You're not going to suddenly go off and tell a different kind of story. So especially if you do an action show, you have to hit your marks and have a little humor and, uh, you know, make sure you have a couple of fights uh, along the way because that's what keeps the eyeballs, you know, uh, on the show. Uh, in terms of emotionally, if you're talking about context, well, all of this has to do with a writer having empathy, having some kind of connection with their own emotional uh, depth. You have to be able to say, how would I feel about this set of circumstances? How would I react when things don't go as they should? You basically have to make sure, because even if you're doing a cartoon, everything that we do has to be based in the human condition. You always have to write from a point of emotional truth. Even if you're talking about a, a talking bear or, you know, or, or, or a sponge, they have to, you know, even though they're, they can be as silly as heck, you want to make sure that what happens rings true. So as you're trying to raise stakes, you have to say, okay, you know, like with any dramatic story, the stakes are rise as the conflicts, as the impediments to your protagonist or antagonist, what, what their goals are, what gets in the way of their achieving their goals. And how will, you know, you really get a sense of their personality and you hope that it's an identifiable personality. You have to be able to say, okay, this impediment will lead to this, these choices. What choice is the most interesting, the most dramatic, the most emotionally satisfying and intriguing? And then you hope within the confines of that particular kind of storytelling, you can do that. Um, this brings to mind something that happened a long time ago at Disney, to me. Uh, <laughs> one of the early episodes I wrote for um, Bonkers, a show that I co-created, but not according to the people who were running this studio at the time. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the episode I wrote was called Quibbling Rivalry, and it was about the lead female, uh, Miranda Wright, who was the cop partner, human cop partner of Bonkers D. Bobcat, uh, and her sister, who was a news reporter. And the sister came in and kind of stirred the pot and was trying to find out, you know, embarrass bonkers and so forth. And when that script came through the pipeline, the gentleman who was in charge of the studio at that time, who will remain nameless, uh, yes. said, we have, no, we have no business doing a show like that. Because that was, his perspective was that Disney is not going to do stuff about feelings, about emotional conflict, about sibling rivalry. Now, subsequently, when I got to work on shows like X-Men or Static Shock uh, or the various iterations of Ben 10 that I worked on, that the, it was a 180 degrees from that. We wanted to show people's feelings. We wanted to be real world uh, oriented. So we could do shows like, well, like, like the, the one that Dwayne McDuffie and Alan Burnett did for uh, Static Shock that got a Humanitas Award Jimmy. about uh, bringing uh, a gun to campus. Oh. I did a, a, a one um, called Frozen Out, and I think Dave, you directed that. I directed it. Yeah, permanent. And that was and that was uh, Static interacts with a another Bang Baby who uh, had you know freezing powers, but she was also homeless and experiencing mental ir illness. So yes. you could do stories that were about the human condition, and that as a writer is far more satisfying, you know, when you get those rare opportunities to do stuff that, that speaks to the heart and as well as the head. Well, and I mean, it, as, as a director, you know, as someone who had the pleasure of an honor of directing that episode <laughs> and working on the show, that was something that I thought separated static um, from Batman. And, you know, on Batman, we could only do, you know, which was fine. I mean, Batman had great, great stories. 
Oh, fabulous. My it, God. And, and, but I really believe that static was anything went. You could do straight up action to talking about mental illness, to talking about gun control, to talking about, you know, um, piracy and music. Right. Um, it was, it just, it was a show that was able to, to touch every, you could do wacky, funny, you could do really serious and dramatic and it all worked. Yep. And I know for myself as, as a director, I was aware of it at the time, even though it was very early in my career, just how special that was, um, right. you know, and how, and how unique that was at the time. Um, I mean, we're talking, what was it, 2001? 2000, 2001, it was a great experience with that. Yeah, for, it, it was a, a spectacular show. And, and I think a great, I mean, the show was based on a comic book created by the late Dwayne McDuffie uh -huh. and Dennis Cowan and their partners uh, at Milestone Comics. Uh, and, but the show itself was run by Alan Burnett, who retired a couple of years ago. And Alan is the, I won't say unsung, but the undersung uh, you know, the, the, the brains behind the outfit, the, the, the genius who made all of the Warner Brothers shows from the original Batman series forward yeah. uh, so successful because Alan, in, in addition to being a, a lovely fellow, uh, has a, a spectacular story sense. And he was also this there kind of Zen master. He People would be running around with their heads, you know, falling off and he would he would just come in and everybody would get calm because <laughs> Alan had the answer instantly. He, and everybody said, oh, okay, well, well I, now, now we see how to do it. And that's the kind of, it, it, I, I still say, even though Alan's retired happily and, and just doing fine in Florida, um, I, someday I want to grow up to be Alan Burnett because he <laughs> would be this guy who would just make it all make sense and work brilliantly. It was terrific. Yeah, I, I loved working with Alan. Alan's yeah. one of my favorite, you know, and I really do think I'm here. Everything you said, yeah. um, you know, uh, is very true when like he was, you know, there was never a time that you couldn't go to Alan and ask him something and he would have an answer for you. Or, you know, he went to bat for numerous things on static um, for yeah. the for the artists. You know, there was an episode. It was what it was yours. It was the Batman episode. Uh, and, the big leagues, yes, and, yeah. and that was there, that was a lot of fun to write. No, that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to board. And the there was a scene that I added because you didn't put Har Harley wasn't part of that. And I said, eh, I think we should put Harley in here somewhere. So I put a picture of Harley on the Joker's desk, and when the Joker <laughs> has a temper tantrum, he breaks, he throws the picture, it breaks it. Uh -huh. And what I did is I came back later because we came back to the Joker's office, and I had a, a close up on the picture lovingly taped and framed and like you know in a joker way and yeah. i thought it was just a touching kind of moment that the joker actually has a heart right right so we get the bs and p notes and yeah. B he says um we're the that the this week you got to take this out because it's it's symbolic of an abusive relationship and you know you have to take it out and alan stormed into my office and he said don't change on fucking thing he's like, you know, and, he's, and, and I said are you sure he's like yeah he's like I'm gonna fight that he goes that's a great addition and it's fun yes. and we're keeping it and he's and sure enough he fought it and it, yeah they kept it in the episode you because know? you know he he knows again this is the thing it's that kind of detail and whether it's in the script or it comes in a board it, it's like that's a real personality thing. One of your questions had to do with how do you get the, the, the emotional content, uh, the conflict? It's all about what would this person do? How would he or she feel? And that is a brilliant insight into that personality. And yes, they had a horrible relationship you would never want to emulate, but it is right. the kind of thing where that's so true to who they were. Right. Yeah. It was a great ad. Great addition. No, oh, thanks. Like yeah. that was, it was just funny that that was, you know, that, you know, it was just, just this little moment, but you get that BS and P note and you're like, well, what the hell show have you yeah. been watching? Of course they have an abusive relationship. I mean, some, you know, sometimes, you know, those, the BM, the BS and P notes, you know, they just, sometimes you just go, well, you just, you're just reading way too much into this. Well, that's what I said. It said way too yeah. much about the executive who sent that note. That yeah, really. You know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, like, Len, I, did, did, did we ever, did we ever do Quibbling Rivalry? Yeah. I thought so. 
that was that in the first 20 episodes yeah uh for those who don't know this is uh bonkers was a, one of those series that you know it's it's kind of a bittersweet thing the short version is we started out with bonkers former actor turned cop in a quasi kind of weird um roger rabbity world but it didn't work as well because it was animated anyway the show got rushed into production uh the original setup was bonkers and miranda right were beat cops uh the scripts were we were told were wonderful until the animation started coming back from some not great animation studios at yeah. least that's my memory of it yep. and so they shut down the uh, show uh those of us who had been working on it first time around were uh asked to move on to other shows and uh, uh that's uh, when i came on yeah and then and you were working with gordon and all those guys yeah and, and um bob taylor and uh they were they rebooted it and they did uh he had uh, lucky Pakel as bonkers buddy and a lot more of the shows went to some wonderful animation studios like in australia and so the show had this weird bifurcated feel about it yeah. and it wasn't a great success but you know, um, what are you going to do? I I, I co-created it. Uh, at least that's my perspective with a guy named Ralph Sanchez. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it um, it didn't work out quite as we'd hoped. Yeah. This um, happened, by the way. Along your, if you have a career that's long enough, uh -huh. you'll have Perfect. some things where you say, "God, that was great," and you'll also have some things. Oh gosh, uh, that thing. <laughs> now there is a volume uh, about uh, 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 cartoons where somehow uh, the guy who compiled this, I think it was like printed on through McFarland Press or something like that. I believe I actually got credit as being one of the creators of the series. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but I like you, but, but I like you, Len, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a credit that I put high up on the, uh, <laughs> on the resume. But, <laughs> you know, the good news was that uh, at least for me, was when they uh, uh, when they shut down the production and Bob Taylor rebooted it. And and you know the thing with with Bob was being being the phenomenal animator that he was. You know he 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 found a way to make it work. You know uh, through through the animation and tying in your your version into his version. And at the end of the day, it kind of it it it's it filled the slot in the Disney afternoon. <laughs> that's, that, you know, that's the thing. Now, for those that are too young to remember this, um, there was something called syndicated television. And basically what happened when, when Disney TV animation started, it was, they were doing two shows. They did the Wuzzles and they right. did um, the Gummy Bears. Gummy Bears. Wuzzles was on CBS when there was a Saturday morning television. Gummy Bears was on NBC and then later ABC, I think. Then they just said to themselves, you know what? There's this thing called syndicated television where we could take a block of TV five days a week and turn out giant numbers of episodes. So the first thing out of the box there was DuckTales, the original iteration of DuckTales. And so we ended up doing these enormous blocks of 65 episodes each. And so you had shows like, uh, like, DuckTales and Tailspin and Goof Troop and so and Darkwing Duck, Duck and, yeah. and Darkwing Duck and Chip and Dale and everybody we were all thrilled because we had these multi-year contracts and yes. they'd have 18 or so writers on staff and floors after floors of artists of every stripe and it was uh, it was like wow so this is what working for a living is like in animation and we always thought it would never end and then it did and then it did but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it, for a while there, I mean, I was there for five and a half years. I don't know yeah. how long you were there, Dave. I was, I was there, I was there for seven and a half years. Wow. But, wow. but, but I, I spent five years um, uh, in production. And then the last two, two and a half years is when I was development art director. And I was working with Greg and Bob Klein in uh, developing gargoyles and then uh and then mighty ducks yeah uh and then uh, and then i left right. to go direct 
and and the the button on the story about the Disney afternoon was after a, a numbers of years the syndicated television market disappeared and was in in its stead you had all of these networks that were specific for doing animation like Nickelodeon Cartoon Network things Disney Channel obviously uh, I should say Disney Tune. Disney well, it was Disney, well, it was Disney Channel when, when syndication stopped. But the thing is, with, with the Disney Channel was, there was no guarantee that if we created a show at, at Disney TV Animation, that they would just go ahead and put it on the Disney Channel. I mean, we, we thought that we had, we still had the golden goose. Even though syndication had gone away, we now had a cable channel. So we had a home, whatever we want to do, we'll do it and we have a place to put it. And that wasn't... That wasn't the case. The oh. Disney Channel, Disney Channel treated Disney TV like any other vendor that was coming through the door, presenting uh, a, 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 you know a show. Fascinating. And, right. yeah, and so little, it, and it, little by little, it, the business it changed. Down. It did. Tremendously. Yeah. It, it seems probably seems in retrospect like overnight, but probably wasn't. But you guys got to keep in mind, we probably all of us have worked now in what will probably be the golden age of. TV animation. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, think about it. Think about in the past, you know, it, from the time you guys started till now, how much more content there is. And, and you know, at this point in time, and, and how much it's changed. I mean, the, you know, when we're talking about static and the things that you could do in static, you know, Steven Universe was completely about, you know, I mean, that series had such depth to it and yes. and now there's all of these series that are no longer the things that we used to talk about when we were working and you'd be like oh it'd be great if we could do this or do that now it's a reality these things are happening because yeah. you have netflix you have amazon you have disney plus and it's probably the con the amount of work that's going to be done in the next probably 10 years the shows that would be, you know, I would imagine there'll be a huge leap. So I, you know, I think that we were probably all responsible in those nineties and early two thousands for kind of making that mark and kind of, you know, and pushing the envelope and pushing things a little bit further. Yeah, absolutely. I, you're absolutely right. And, you know, we, uh, there, some of us, you know, are silly enough to keep doing it, you know, uh, yeah, which, yeah, is, me, which yeah. is nice, you know, uh, as long as they keep hiring us. Well, yeah. yeah as long well, as the I, checks don't bounce, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well I mean, However, also, so much, more of the checks now are coming from overseas. That's the thing for, for mm -hmm. your, for your, uh, yeah. student here, your, the people listening in, in the whole audience. Um, so much more of this is an international thing, not merely, you know, stuff being shipped yeah. overseas, but the product is being created overseas. Yeah. I mean, the last few jobs I've worked on have been international co-productions for the most part. Mm. Uh, you know, it's either from the UK or there, there were several shows a while back in France, certainly Canadian. China, 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 China's becoming pretty big with. Uh, yeah, uh, I have some friends who worked on a show that we will never see here called mm -hmm. something Fawn the Wonder Deer or something like that. But anyway, <laughs> you know, it's just, this is, this is the way of the world. Yeah. It is truly an international business. Some wonderful animation. I mentioned the people down uh, in, in uh, New Zealand doing extraordinary animation that was produced in England. Um, the, there's a company in Ireland called uh, Brown Bag. I worked at Brown Bag. Brown Bag, yeah. they do beautiful work. I did really Doc McStuffin. I did Doc McStuffin. And, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, other, the other show, the, 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 with the bees or what, I think I can't remember what, what that is right now. Yeah. My kids loved Doc McStuffin. That was right, right in that wheelhouse when they were little. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I was going to say, David, that uh, at least the, the, the group that I came up with and, and, you know, and, and your, your, your wave just kind of came up right behind us. But um, even though we knew we were making cartoons, I think we, we were all kind of frustrated filmmakers. Yeah. So in, as we were doing storyboards and interpreting the, the scripts, we were not just, you know, falling back on cookie cutter uh, 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 storytelling. 
yeah. that we were we tried to and I think we were really encouraged by the writers and, and the producers to create something really worth watching. I, you know, I feel and to really and to really tell a visual story along with what what the writers had created so that it was really something that had some depth and, and well, I you, think that's you, how you, we wound up with that stuff. That we well, did. you had a lot of respect for the form and uh, filmmaking, not just animation. Like, yes, I've always considered myself very fortunate and I've always told my students this and people that I've worked with that I worked at Epoch and worked with you and worked with Brad, Brad and, you know, and you had guys that were there who were passionate about making film and making and, and not not downplaying it or poo-pooing it and saying, oh, we're making just a stupid cartoon. I, I, can, I, I feel very fortunate that I was in, that, that I was able to kind of come in on your coattails that way. Because if we hadn't, I think, I don't know where, I, where my career would have gone because it mm -hmm. always, because you don't know the questions to ask <laughs> and, and, until you're kind of given that information. So you don't yeah. know what, what you don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> right and like having guys tell like like brad you know would be like look at hitchcock look at you know all of these films read these books look at these things and it was Absolutely. like wow and even though i came you know because i came from comics and i worked for marvel before i worked at epoch you know in marvel comics i was yeah. war machine and stuff and i you know i really i was i loved will eisner i you know bought you know sequential art almost the day that it came out uh -huh. and 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 I foolishly thought it was the same, and it is in some ways. But cinema is its own unique thing. And you guys, that was what you guys exposed me to with that. Was no, it's more than just it's 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 not like not a comic book. It's it's different. This is and here's why it's different. Right. Well, I think we, you know, uh, at least the the people who I came in contact with, and, and Brad Raider is is you know one of them, and and you know. Um, uh, I came from comics too, and and Will Eisner was a huge influence yeah. on me, and and I knew Will, and so I was able to kind of le learn at the feet of, mm, of one of the masters. Um, but but you figure out you you take what they pass on to you, and you know the animation guys or comic book guys artists who are passionate about not just making a cartoon but but trying to make a film and use film technique to help tell the story we figured out a way to take what we loved about the spirit and yeah. wills where he placed camera or how he would take a moment in time and split it over three or four panels to tell milliseconds and 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 really controlling how the reader reads the story in time and in pacing so that even though it was printed on a piece of paper, it felt like it was moving. Yeah. You look at watching a movie. And so we found a way to take the thing, those things that we loved and bring them into the storyboard. And I mean, I, I always approached my drawing storyboard as if I was drawing comic book pages, uh. you know, uh, even if it was taking everything I learned about how to draw comics the Marvel way or, you know, the, the, whatever I learned at, you know, from, from Joe Kubert or, you know, those type of things um, and brought them to storyboarding. And that's what kept it fun for me. You know, every storyboard, every new script I got was, was a brand new thing to try and crack and make a, a movie that kind of had my handprint on it. Right. Um, instead of just saying, okay, well, you know, wide shot, medium shot, close up, close up, close up, yeah. medium <laughs> shot, you know, and, and just yeah. go, with, go with a rhythm. And, and yeah. you know, um, I, and unfortunately, you know, after there, there are some board people that you find, you know, they've just been doing it too long. They got a formula, they bang it out, yeah. they collect the check, and, and, and it is just a job. Yeah. You know, yeah, and so- you, I've never viewed it that picture. way. I can't, you know, for good and bad. I mean, sometimes it's painful because you want to do your own, you know, you yeah. try to bring something and you, and you fail, either you fail miserably only in the sense that somebody else doesn't agree with your vision of it, which is, you, you know, or, you know, but the successes are just incredible when you have them. It's like, I oh, know, I, you know, Len, I, I was going to mention uh, when you were talking, uh, addressing the idea about uh, a deep character and, uh, and applying that to the, um, uh, the story and the storytelling. 
uh, you know, and, and everything you're saying, it doesn't just apply to drama, it applies to comedy too. Oh, the, more, yep. the more you know about the character, whether it's Bugs or Daffy, you know, what drives them? What do they want? And mm -hmm. then as a writer, you're trying to go, okay, well, what would Daffy do here? And what would be either the most successful and turns into the most painful for him because pain is funny. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody yeah. else's pain, yes. Yes, <laughs> you know, but, but you know, if he, when he gets his duck bill blown off or that type of thing, we yeah. laugh because it's, you know, he tried real hard to be the top guy and somebody pulls the carpet out from underneath him. And, well, and the, the, whatever length of story you're telling, you always need to establish that need or want. I mean, yes. every musical at Disney, musical particularly uh, animated film they always start with the i want song absolutely you establish what the character is looking for in hers or her life yes and you know that's you know uh quiet little village whatever uh you know uh, it doesn't matter you're always trying to say okay what does this person need i i noticed that one of your uh persons here i asked the what's the tip on writing a villain Mm -hmm. uh, that effectively challenges the heroes throughout the journey. Well, you know, the, the, it's the old, you know, sort of writing one on one. You can only judge your hero by the quality <laughs> of the villain. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and the the thing you always want to do with the villain, because we've all seen or written episodes where the villain is just, you know, uh, uh, ha ha, I shall take over the world. Why? Because that villain truly must have some reason. I'm not talking about your run-of-the-mill bank robbers that Spider-Man has to capture because that's right. that they're, they're just a plot device. But if you're talking about a, a true pro, uh, antagonist who who's butting heads with your hero, that villain must believe in his or her heart that her his or her he or she is the hero of the story. Right. What he no. is doing is the right thing to do. Yep. Yep. However twisted and immoral or whatever it is, that's what that villain believes with his or her own you know, heart. And so that's what makes it a great conflict because you have two opposing philosophies. What you're doing is bad. No, what I'm doing is for the greater good. Yep. That's where you have a really interesting story to tell. If you have two people with strong wills, and the power to you know bring that will to bear on whatever it is another person or a society it's 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 that's the best way to have a really strong villain and in turn a very strong hero because the hero is up against a formidable uh, uh, opponent. opponent yeah 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 absolutely anyway i'm sorry i digressed no no oh, no 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 that's, that's well, I mean, that, that was part two of the answer to that question yeah. 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 It's, I mean, I think that, um, you know, for, for myself that, that, you know, it boarding, you're only a lot of times you can, you can make a good, you can make a good script. Great. It's hard to make a bad script. Good. And I think that, Amen. you know, and I, and I think <laughs> that, uh, and I yeah. think that, um, I think that, you know, it's always that that's always, a, um, when you're lucky enough to work with good people, that's always, it's a, it's a, a benefit to that, you know, and Lennon, and for sure. I mean, I, I think I'm very lucky to, you know, work uh, with you on, on stuff um, for that reason, you know, it's, it, it's, and I think, and I really do feel that the best stuff comes from collaboration. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just such a, such a tricky thing to make a great cartoon or, or make a great film. It, it's like anything, but there's a lot that goes into it. And it's not just up to one person to make it that way. You could write a great script and have a really bad board crew and it won't come across as well. Or, and, or, or a bad animation crew exactly. overseas that yeah. just crap it out. Well, this is the yeah. thing. I mean, this is what I do. Everyone you have, you know, any, any TV show, any feature, I'm sure it's the same idea. You know, if, if your timing directors don't know comedy, oh. the, the jokes are going to fall flat. 
timing if is they don't weird. understand how if, if a, a board artist it, like you say if they're just going through the motions and they're having a guy on this side and a guy on this side and that's the end of the conversation you, you know there's no no visual interest it's going to make for a dull episode you so know, you gotta have everybody bringing as best they can their a game bringing something unique a perspective even if you know the people you know higher up the food chain say no i'd rather see it a different way at least you've you've given it a shot you've tried yeah. to be creative we're all just trying to turn out the best product we can turn out yep. um sorry i shouldn't have called it product but that's what it is <laughs> well, it is it is i mean it is product yeah well you know Len, when, when we were doing yeah. darkwing duck um as, as i started getting kind of loosened up on that show and was looking for places to integrate gags, I learned a couple things. And one of the things I learned was that I never did a big gag as a standalone, because if the episode ran long, that would be the first thing that they would chop out because there was no dialogue attached to it. Yep. So whenever I did a big a, a, a comedy thing that kind of strayed from the script, I always integrated it, I always attached it to, to dialogue. So there was a less of a chance it was gonna go away. That was number one. Number two, um, I actually would sometimes I would take out my uh, my my animation stopwatch, and I would do a rough time of a gag so that the the guy in the, who took timing would know exactly what I had in mind when I when I boarded it, so that he would see it the way I saw it. And now, did you actually in the board mark number yeah. of frames or number of seconds, or how did you do it? Feet. I would I yeah. would do feet. You would say yeah. you would say this sequence should be thirty three feet. Yeah. Or, and then, or sometimes what I would do is um, I would draw, actually draw pencil lines through the dialogue and then, and then write little, you know, make little arrows for like, for, okay, the first three words of the sentence, he does this, second three, this, 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 because I was, I was building, combining the dialogue and the, uh, and the action. Yeah. And, and, it, and it helped, you know, because, you know, the, the timing guys, they were, you know, they had footage that they had a, you know, time and get, get mm -hmm. through the processing and write the sheets and that type of thing. So, you know, if you could help them out a little bit and help them see exactly what you wanted, the, the chances were uh, that you would get what you want. And, and that was always something, always something that I tell my, my animation students that if you, there's something that you see specifically that you need to have happen, you need to put it in that storyboard because if you leave it up, you know, it, it, as it goes down the pipeline, the more you leave to the next guy, it's going to get, it's going to move further and further away from, from what it was that, that, you know, what, what you see, what you saw that being on the screen. Right. Um, uh, the, there's a, there's a writing corollary to some of this too, which is never repeat a joke unless you're building on the joke. Absolutely. Making, making sure that when you are, you know, doing a gag, don't just repeat a punchline, which is totally is death unless you there's a way to turn it to make it interesting and new because the the repetition will be cut because it's just not funny the yeah. second time around uh -huh. you know yeah absolutely the tricks of the trade <laughs> yeah like big big tips of the trade yeah um so we're, we're coming up on an hour and a half and i and i know that you guys are probably <laughs> no, I don't want you, you know, you guys, especially Dave, you're on the East Coast. So yeah, yeah. I can answer a couple more questions. Say, oh, okay. I'm good. I'm good to so, go. Okay. So I, I don't want to keep, you know, I can do this all night, but I just want to make sure you guys are, and Len, whenever you want to ch check out, you feel more than. You no, know. I, I, you know, listen, uh, these days we're, we're all of us uh, looking to have a conversation. Uh, okay. You know, uh, thank you. Thank goodness. Yes. Uh, you know, my 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 wife is here taking good care of me as I sit in my office and write away, uh, because her production her her work is in live action and it's yeah months. We're we're uh, it's a brave new world for all of us. So glad to have a chat. All right. See, well, good. I I can, I tell people that my world hasn't changed. As a freelancer, you know, sitting at home and working, dressed or not dressed, is the, the way I've been living my life for the past twenty years. So, <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, it, you know, it's just one of yeah. those things where because well, somebody says, for dressing. "Yeah, well, I," <laughs> you know, I, at least this first go. Now, now, Dave, if you have me on again, I, I may, you know, now it's old hat now. Yeah. So, so but uh, you know, just the, the the thing is, is that now that somebody says, "Well, you." 
you, you shouldn't go to the store. That's all I want to do now is go to the store. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. 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 But otherwise, yeah. you know, I, the, 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 biggest, the biggest travel time that I've had, you know, uh, in the past, like, you know, 15 years is like going from one room to the other. Yeah, I, yeah, this is a, an actually an excellent thing for for all the folks listening. Uh, the freelance life, which most people will have because these staff opportunities are few and far between, um, the freelance life is by nature a fairly solitary endeavor. You will spend a lot of time alone in your room, uh, and uh, it's it can be a wonderful, wonderful way to make a living. Odds are you're not going to get rich unless you do come up with the next SpongeBob. But you get a chance to practice your your art, your use your skills, and you're part of something. As you've heard all of us white hairs saying, that you know <laughs> will have um, will have longevity yeah. more so in a lot of ways than live action stuff. And you know I've come, I started out as a live action guy, and I still aspire to, you know. See if I couldn't get a sitcom sold and all that stuff. But the fact is, these cartoons are evergreen. You know, they the are. animation style may look a little outdated 30 years down the road, but honest to God, you know, this stuff sticks around and you're part of something that matters. Like we were talking about, You Made My Childhood. Is, it's, it's lovely. It's a yeah. great feeling to be part of something that is a positive experience for people. Or you know, not only. You know, for those of you who are aspiring to do this or who are already doing this for a living, good on you. Keep at it because it's it's a um, it sure it sure beats digging ditches, you know. Yeah, it yeah. is a great way to make a living. Yeah, uh, you know, you're you're especially. You know, I mean, if you love to draw, the fact that you're you know yeah. you're 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 drawing pictures, you're making film, you're contributing, and you know, there's still after all these years, I, Len, I'm sure you're the same way. There's still you get a you still get off a little bit seeing your name pop up in the credits, even though they flash by faster than ever before now. Yeah, but, like the corner, but yeah, that's true also. But you know, this, the thing, uh, we're, we're, we're very fortunate that we get a chance to do this for a living and entertain people. Um, and, you know, we may think of it as ephemera, but it, is, it, it means something. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. And by the way, each new job, this is also important for people to remember, each new job it's like the first day of school. Every time you get a new script thrown on your desk or you have to write the new script first, if for those who are writers, it's like, oh, I've got to reinvent the way I do things to one degree or another. Sometimes it's autopilot. But yeah. Most of the time it's like, oh, this is a new challenge. What can I do here that's different than what I did before? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's you, you want to challenge yourself too. Yep. You yep. know, I mean, everybody does stuff for, you know, for the paycheck from time to time. But you really, if you're lucky, you're working on a show or, you know, there's, there's something that really gets your interest and, and keeps you engaged and you give that much more of yourself to it and everybody benefits from that enthusiasm. Yeah. You know, I, I can speak from, you know, my own personal uh, ex experience. I've never done a job that I haven't tried to have that philosophy going into. I mean, it, it, you know, sometimes it's more frustrating than others for various reasons. It, 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 but I think that's the juice. That's the thing that makes you want to get up in the morning and do the work and, and come to the drawing board or solving those problems in, in a way that you've never solved something before that push yourself to challenge yourself to say, what can I do differently this time around? That's how you learn. That's how you evolve. I think as an, as an artist, you know, if, if, I think it, the day that you stop doing that, and you probably should get out of the business if you, that doesn't inspire you to do that anymore. Yeah, uh, really. So, yeah. no, it, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be pulling teeth. It can no. be on a daily basis. Oh, sure, sure. But for the process, yeah. over time, you want to say, "Oh, I'm glad I," you know, it's the old. I hate writing. I love having written. A lot of people say that. But yeah, I also have to find some joy in the process of doing it too. You know, along the way. Uh, it, yeah. it, Delayed gratification is fine to an extent, but <laughs> hey, that was a good day. I yeah. I got six yeah. pages written and hooray for me. Well, you we're know? never gonna. We're probably even with the age of social media and the age of instant gratification, so to speak. I do think it's still a process that we don't realize what we're doing. Sometimes, maybe until ten years down the road, 
the, because the people that we're speaking to for the most part are kids and they're the ones who are, they're the ones I think that need it the most, that need that, that energy and that life that we, that we're so lucky to give and bring to a kid who might not have much. It might, you know, that might be the one thing in their day that really is the one half hour that they have that's they're happy and that they have something. Um, and I think that, you know, that those yes. things are, you know, are really, um, we're lucky and blessed to be able to be in an, in an, to be able to do that for people. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, one little anecdote. Um, I was one of, one of those panels with Larry Houston and Eric Lee Wald and Julia Lee Wald. Uh, again, these are the people that did the original X-Men series. Mm -hmm. And there was a Q and A after we'd all, you know, rattled on a bit from the, from the podium. And um, this guy walks up to the microphone and he looks like Jack Black dressed as Wolverine. I mean, square guy, <laughs> butt chops, you know, uh, 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 lumberjack ja uh, shirt, talons. And he said, thank you for making this show. Because again, this was a once a week show on Fox Kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you for making this show. This is the show that kept me around because I didn't want to leave because I wanted to see what next episode was going to be. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and to, we're all sitting, uh, you know, on, in our chairs crying that this guy said we kind of helped save his life. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a big honking, you know, uh, burden, responsibility, gift, yeah. you know, for all of us because yeah. we're, you know, it meant that much to him to wait yeah. for the next episode. Yeah. Clearly, he did not have a lovely childhood. But right. somehow or another, we helped him get through that childhood. Yeah. Oh, wow. That, that just, you know, that, if anybody has any kind of an ego about what they do, that's got to take you down a peg because it's like, that's humbling. We, 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 we're in his debt because of, you know, his sharing something as, as personal and painful and you know, moving is that. No. And you yeah. hear that kind of stuff all the time, you know, and it doesn't have to be life and death. You can just say, hey, you made me laugh. And that's, that's a gift all by itself. Yeah. yeah. And I've we, heard we, plenty from people in my career, and I'm sure you guys have too, you know, for students, if you're teaching, um, who will, t you know, tell you point blank that, you know, I had a miserable childhood. And that was very much like the story that, you know, that you related Len, and you know, and, and you and you really do start to realize when you put it into a bigger picture, just how impactful what we do really is. And, you know, we always say like, it's not brain surgery, but it is in, in but it is life saving. And there are there are things, you know, that are there that are, um, you know, influencing a kid, maybe from being somebody who's maybe not such a good person later on in life that maybe the, the lessons that they get from some of the works that we've done inspires them to go down a different life path that they are. They become a cop or they become, you know, a positive member of society when they could have been somebody who wasn't. Okay. So, you know, those yeah. are well, well, we want to hear from the guys that became like, you know, mass murders because they watched an episode of, you know, Dork Hunters <laughs> Outer Space or something. <laughs> yeah. That would be bad. I was going to say what what we do just really stems from a very ancient position, you know, in 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 tribes, you know, yeah. there was the, the storyteller. We 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 yeah. are the storytellers, yeah. you know, and we just happen to do it on paper and, and pencil and you know as a collaboration rather than just one guy making up uh, uh, stories. We you know we we get together and 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 make up make something that people will sit down and and they get we get taken away by it, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and they enjoy it, you know, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a fun thing to do. Yeah. Uh, is there any, uh, I'm, I'm I was just going to say, I'm going to ask some questions. So we're going to, so get to some people so you guys can, right. so, any, so Jade asked, uh, any books on screenwriting that you yeah. would recommend? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know, guys. Um, Sinfield? <laughs> Uh, you know, look, there are a lot of people that write wonderful books and who write, uh, uh, who teach classes. There are a number of them. Um, you know, um, my, 
the, the ones that have been most helpful for me, helpful to me are William Goldman's Adventures in the Screen Trade. Yeah. Because that's, that's not a great book. That's not an instruction manual. And a lot of it will seem a little dated now. Yeah. But what that does provide you is a sense of what it's like the ups and downs. And this, this was a giant screenwriter. This was a, a big deal. He did Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And Princess of, Bride. Princess he, Bride, Magic. Princess Bride. He do. I, would no. he write, he, I think he wrote the book. I'm not sure if he did this, the screenplay for that. Uh, you know, it just, uh, you know, a fabulous career. Uh, um, wasn't he also on All the President's Men? I think. Anyway, uh, you know, it's just like big deal screenwriter. And he had projects that, you know, hit a brick wall yep. and stuff that went sideways and didn't turn out the way they should. So that's the kind of thing that, that speaks to the not so much the how to's, but what it's like to be a writer. Um, you know, the problem with the instruction manual type things, you have to hit your, in a screenplay, you have to hit your first act break by 28 to 30, or your script will not work, nobody will ever buy it, and you'll sit alone in your room until, it, anyway. You don't want to go with those so much. They can be useful, they can give you a guide, but you can't use that as some kind of paint by numbers. You have to find a way to express yourself. Right. You know, the most interesting screenplays that have come out in the last few years, most of them don't fit the 90 to 120 page three act structure that you have seen written about in so many of these books. That isn't to say, I mean, you know what they say, you have to learn the rules to break them. So don't think that you can just write however you please. I mean, I can't tell you how many screenplays I wrote over, you know, early on in my career where the first act, which should have a reasonable length, became longer and longer and longer. And if your first act is still around page 45 or 50, you're <laughs> not writing a screenplay, you're writing a novel. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you want to be able to do, yeah, you want to be able to understand how scripts are written. The best way to do that is to read other screenplays. Other produced screenplays are particularly useful. And you can find those at, if you're in Los Angeles, at any, when we're not all hidden away from one another, you can go to various libraries. Writers Guild has a library. Uh, Motion Picture Academy has a library. The various uh, film schools have various libraries. Those are places that you can go and read the best scripts, television or film, ever written and you say to yourself, oh, now I get it. I understand what they were doing at the time. Yeah. So uh, that, that's a very good way to learn about the craft of writing. And that, that would be my best advice. Well, there's, so there's websites that you can go to where uh, some of the more contemporary film scripts have been posted. Uh, yeah. you know, there are websites about screenwriting to teach uh, the answer questions about screenwriting and they make some of these scripts available. So there, so there's that. Right. Um, and, and then you can learn format and things like that. Right. Uh, some, of, some of the scripts that you'll see in bookstores and online, they are transcriptions. They are not actual screenplays, but you can have, you can get to hang on, hang on. Um, here you can find a, here's Adam McKay's, Vice, for some reason, I happened to pick that up because I was on the top of the file, and it shows you proper screenplay format. And this is the way to go when you want to write a script. Uh, and it's, you can sort of see, oh, okay, I, that's how they do it. And again, you'll see that scripts aren't written like we do in animation. It's a master scene. There's a very little dialogue. Uh, you know, you can also get your hands on some of the Pixar scripts, I'm sure. Yeah. And that will show you what an animation screenplay looks like not that much different, quite frankly, these days. Yeah. Um, now, so I, I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of partial to save the cat, and, uh, and, and, and I, and, and, you know, so, and when I asked you in the early part of this, if, uh, this, uh, this conversation, if you were a structure or by the seat of your pants kind of guy, is because I'm, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. Okay. So, so when I plot out a screenplay, story idea, or that type of thing. Um, so uh, I'll, I, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that's, I'll, I'll come up with a story, I'll, I'll kind of do a little bit of an outline, 
And then when I start to write, I just set it aside and I never look at it again. Okay, but now, you've done work in your head. Yeah, and the other thing too, and I'm, I'm gonna hold this up to, the, uh, uh, to my camera here, is because I'm a visual guy, um, I like to see the ebb and flow of a story. So um, I don't know if you can, you can see this, but I, I diagram it like a sentence. Sure. And, and I plot, uh, uh, I, I start out by plotting key events that I, I clearly see. Okay, I have to have this, I have, and, and about where it'll take place. I'll kind of fill in between until I've, I've built in, in, in abbreviated version of, of a story. Again, I have it here. Once I've done, I guess once I've kind of worked my way through the story, I, I guess for me, I understand the rhythm of the story I want to tell. Uh -huh. And then I never, and then I never look at that again, because I, I, I know, I, I understand the musicality of how the story is going to happen. Right. And so, and, and so that's kind of, so I, I save the cat is just kind of like a, a safety net. So I kind of go, okay, all right. Yeah, all right. I know that. Oh, here's the uh, here's the fun and games part, or you know, here's the the the, the darkest of the night type of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I tell you, for for any kind of writer, uh, and I recommend this book. Uh, I actually I I I I make it part of my storyboard class uh, at the uh, at the Art Institute, um, and it's this book by Stephen Pressfield called The War of Art. And okay. the, the reason it's so important is that part of the reason that people don't either start projects, but more important, finish projects, whether, whether they're good or bad, because no matter what you do, you're going to learn something uh, uh, about the story that you told. And, and, and what it does is it teaches you to not listen to the voice in your head that tells you, you know what? You can't do that. So don't even bother, you know, because, uh, you know, w one of the things that I say to my students is I said, I'm, I'm, Uncle Davey's going to give you a, a, a piece of advice. And, and you, you, if you live by it, uh, it, will, it will help you out immensely. I said, here it is. Get the fuck out of your own way. You know, get rid of the roadblock, go around the roadblocks, walk, you know, just, just keep pressing forward get to the end. You know, you can, you can revise it, you know, even with your storyboards, you can revise it, you can change the shots. If you're writing, you can, you, know, you go back and you change words, you change scenes, you know, I could do this better. You know, this isn't as interesting. And, you know, it just, there's something very satisfying of getting that first, that first yeah. draft down. Yeah. Yeah. Never let the perfect be the enemy of good. You know, it's, yeah. it's yeah, and, I think that let, that's what happens all the time with people. Let's, uh, let's face it, if you're any kind of a creative person, there's that saboteur sitting on your shoulder or in, <laughs> yeah. in your ear who's saying, nah, you can't make this work. No, that's no good. You know, you know what they said about you in elementary school? They were right. We all have to tell, tell that that's the saboteur, shut up. And that's, that's the problem of being a creative person. You are by definition, usually a much more emotionally driven person. And you, you know, I mean, if we're all well adjusted, we'd be working in a bank, right? Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're, uh, we, we, we have to be in touch with those emotions in order to employ them in our storytelling. Yeah. Well, I, I always tell people in my class, it's, it's all subjective. I mean, it's all an opinion. Um, there are, there are no right or wrong. It's, it's actually what makes something unique is what you bring to it, that your take on it. And, and, you know, there's no formula for it, it because when it's formulaic, it's boring anyway. Like what right. makes it good is to go past the formula and, and put yourself into your work. And that's the most enjoyable thing. I know, I'm sure I'm speak preaching to the choir the most satisfying moments you have when you're doing your work or in your career are those moments where you did something and you pushed something and it worked and it stayed in the work. And that's the stuff that you see and you're like, ah, oh, I, I was right. I knew, I knew that would work and I knew that would be great. And a lot of times I think people 
talk, do talk themselves out of certain things, especially as storytellers. They tell themselves, well, that's not how a traditional story should go, or that's not how something would work. Instead of saying, okay, maybe what I'm doing isn't working yet, but if I keep working at it, I will get past that roadblock, like you said, Dave, to get where you need it to go. Uh -huh. And if you're lucky, you're working with people. Sometimes if you're working collaboratively, which animation is, you're working with people that are like-minded and you may not have the answer, but Dave, you might have something that helps break that log jam. So if I show yes. you my stuff, you're like, you know, Dave, that's not working, but what if you did this? That's really interesting. That's a, that's a really great idea. I didn't think about that. And then somebody else says, well, you know, how about if you did this too? And you're like, holy shit, that's great. Now you have something. Now you start to build on that. Absolutely. And what, and you're, I, what you're bringing up, David, is so important because especially if you're in a collaborative in, environment, you want to be like they do in, in an improv. It's always yes and. Yeah. You always want to yeah. be the helpful, <laughs> encouraging person in the room because yeah. there, there are going to be people you work with who are nay, naysayers. Yes. That, their whole uh, sort of... Uh, they, they're considered a good day if they can pick apart somebody else's work. You don't want to be that guy or gal. You want to be the person that is supporting your fellow creative yeah. and saying, that's wonderful. Also, what if you were able to do thus and such? And then it's the other person's job to say, yeah, I like that. Or nah, here's what I'd like to do instead. But be a positive contributor. And then everybody will say, hey, I sure like working with that person. And let's face it, this is all about getting the next job too, sure. I'd like to work with that person again. He or she brought something wonderful into the process. Yes. You want to be and that person. It's, it's a really good point, Len. And yeah. you know, when I teach my class for storyboarding, what I do, I don't know what you do, Dave, with, with your students, but I have them collaborate on a, you know, a script. I'll, I'll launch them. Each person gets their own section of the script and I treat it just like a real work environment. Mm -hmm. And, and those, that assignment has always been like, I do it last. Like we build, you know, people do their individual pitches. I'll give them smaller things to come up and pitch. And, but that one is the one where everybody, people will go on their own to go to coffee shops and meet up and kind of talk. Yeah. And, and I tell them, you know, all the time that it's, it's, I don't want people to lose that because that's something that can get very, get lost very quickly when you're actually working in the real world. So too many people go and sit by themselves in a cube somewhere and they don't interact with each other, even if they're lucky enough to be a part of a staff. The best stuff is when you're actually working together and you know, you get together, whether it be once a week or every couple of days, and you just kind of show each other your work. Mm -hmm. And I've been, you know, I've been lucky in my career, you know, you know, I worked with Darwin Cook, I worked with Adam Van Wick, you know, and these, and these guys are guys that or multiple Annie award winning guys, Emmy winning guys and legends in the business. And they were the first ones to say, Hey, can you look at my work? Can you look at some of the stuff I'm doing? Yeah. Like I just like, and, and you realize like, first of all, a they're humble, but B they're open to that process. They know that they understood that that's how you get better stuff is to put it out there and have people you trust that help you figure the story out and figure out what yep. you're doing. Um, and I'm sure, you know, I don't know what it's like, like in the writer's room, Len, with that stuff. I know it can be competitive, <laughs> you know, just like it is with storyboarding. Some people are really good about it and some people aren't, yeah. um, you know, so I don't, you know, I know that it can be cutthroat at times as well. Well, so. it, it depends on the, the, the kind of show you're doing. Um, if you're talking about it like a primetime animated show like The Simpsons, for example, that is done very much like a situation comedy where you have a lot of writers, all of them working through the, reworking mm -hmm. the script. When you're doing animation like most of us do, it's usually a story editor, maybe a couple of staff writers at best, but usually it's a story editor and a single freelance writer. And those two or you know three people are just working on the, the script together, um, but usually in sequence one after the other. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a different approach depending on what you're doing. Again, very different from most live action where you would have a writer's room.
but the, the, the similarity is that if you're an, a freelance animation writer, you're going in and breaking the story with your showrunner and then you go off and do your work. But that breaking this, this story on the whiteboard or you know, in an exchange of documents, that is the same process. What happens afterwards is different. Most animation is not, to my experience anyway, is not done in the room. There are shows that do do that, and that's great, but that's a very different discipline. And yeah. when you say cutthroat, you know, it can be, you know, especially if you were like in, on a sitcom or the animation equivalent of that, I'm sure you, for, for the um, people who are not extroverts, that's probably a scary place to be. Yeah. But you have to be able to you know, go in to, yeah. there and, and hold your own. Uh, I remember a billion years ago, I was a producer's assistant on a situation comedy. And there were guys that simply could not be in the room. They would go off to their office and that's where they do the writing. But when they did a writer's table, they just clammed up because that's not where they were comfortable. So you, you, you gotta be able to fake being an extrovert under those circumstances. Yep. Maybe that's not the kind of writing you wanna be doing. Yeah. You know? All right, does anybody have any further questions in our chat room that, for these guys? Cause we're gonna wrap this up pretty soon cause they can get the bed or eat or do <laughs> so, there's a dessert in our yeah. future yeah are there any are there any let's see here somebody wrote tips on writing the first act of a feature is that anything that uh, anything you want to touch on len oh sure um writing the first act of a feature requires that you know what the other two acts are <laughs> and there's the secret and, and, there you go there you like, go like i was talking about before you really have to i mean if you say yeah i got this great idea and i'm just gonna wing it now maybe dave schwartz you can do that i can't i have to know and every time i do that the writing takes three or four times as long and the chances of failure of completion are that much greater. You have to know how it's going to end, and, you know, to whatever degree the detail that's necessary for you, yeah. you have to be able to say, okay, I know where this is going. I wonder and, if anybody ever wrote anything and didn't know the ending. Oh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I actually I know that there are a lot of people who just say, you know, I, I, got, I got this idea. I'm going to let the characters tell me what the story I is. Had a, I have a first draft. Game of Thrones comes yeah. to mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a first draft of a mystery novel that I've written. Yeah. And up until probably about five chapters before the end, I still didn't know who did it until all of a sudden I went, oh, I see what I could, okay, that's who did it. And then I finished <laughs> it out. Okay. But, okay. But I mean, the thing was, is that I mean, it was, it was constantly working towards, I, and I think, I think I got really lucky in that subconsciously I continued to structure the story until it just pointed out who'd done it to me. There was, there was another alternative. It was hidden. But, uh, and then it, and then it just kind of snuck up on me and I kind of go, well, if I didn't know who it is, a reader's not going to know. A reader's not going to know who it is. <laughs> and so I go, okay, success. And then I was very happily finished it out, you know? Well, that's, that's great. You're a braver man than I, you know? Yeah, me too. I don't even know well, how you can write a Well, I'll though. tell you something, Len. When, uh, <laughs> when, when I was working on Darkwing Duck, um, the way I worked was I got my hand out from the director and I got my model sheet and, you know, we had six weeks to, to do a section of the storyboard. So, mm, so, I, so I would <laughs> fart around for a week yeah. and then I kind of go, oh, well, okay, they're going to be expecting me in two weeks to turn in the rest for this. I guess I better get going. So I would open up my script to whatever page was my first page and I started drawing. I, I was, but I was just doing, I was just drawing the board as I was reading it. Okay. So yeah. I go, oh, okay. I got this great idea for a gag. And then I turn the page and I go, oh shit. I just pointed myself, I just painted myself into a corner here. Yeah. So then I forced myself to not change what I did, but figure out a way 
to get out of the situation and still maintain the integrity of the story. So, you know, uh, did I get lucky? 95% of the time, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. But it also taught me to, to be able to think ahead in right. sequences to, so that I kind of had an idea how to resolve something in case I did paint myself into a corner. Uh -huh. and, and as a writer, create something, hopefully, that the, uh, uh, that, that the writer who actually wrote the script would go, okay, you know, it's not what I wrote, but you know, I, I, did never, I didn't see that. The, yeah, let's do that. You right. know? Um, and, that, and so I kind of had a bit of a reputation for that. The other thing I had a reputation for was I would, always, I would draw gags into, into the Darkwing Duck boards that, that weren't in the script. I knew that they would get cut, you know, but the process was you would turn in your board, the director would look at it, and then the writers would get a chance to look at the board too and make some notes too. And so I always threw in horrific, dirty gags to see if the writers were paying attention. <laughs> More to the point, it was bra uh, broadcast standards and practices paying attention. Yeah. Well, they they would come out before BSMP got them, but oh, okay. you know, <laughs> but, but you know, all of a sudden, you know, one, one of the writers would turn up at my door and they'd you know, be laughing and they would just like be pointing at the board and I go, I know, I know it's got to come out. I just wanted to jag your wire. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Some of those made it into the show. No. Yeah, that's that's the problem. That's I got really I got really lucky that none of them actually none of none of them none of those things went ran into came into the show. But what did happen was that you know when when I was working on Buzz Lightyear, um, I you know uh, uh, different you know different artists uh, influenced me, and so because we were doing a space show, I was really kind of leaning into Wally Wood. Oh, lovely. Of and course, so, yeah. And so my version of some of those Buzz Lightyear characters really had a little bit of a Wally Wood flavor to them. Now, when, when, when we were doing the, the early days of the Disney afternoon, when you sent the boards overseas, um, the, the job of the animators was to fix the animation, put it on model, you know, kind of spruce it up a little bit so that it maintained the integrity of the designs. Later on down the line, because they were just banging this footage out, they would go to the copy machine, they would blow up the first panel of the storyboard, put that on the animation table, put paper over it, and just clean up the drawing, assuming that what was in the board was on model. And so wow. one, one time, some footage came back on a show of mine uh, that, I, that I boarded, and uh, I think that Tad Stones, who I think was overseeing uh -huh. that show, he, he looked at it and he kind of goes, oh, this has to be a Dave Schwartz board because his style, but you know, the, it, it dropped off the style of the show. That's Dave's style. And of course, you know, there's nothing they could do. So there's a point there where all the characters kind of shift into more of a Wally Wood look. And then it goes back to, you know. <laughs> Boy, I, on, on Static, we, you know, but very first show I had ever directed. And it was the, we, we, we got the A footage back, the A roll stuff back. Uh -huh. And they showed me, you know, and they showed me the uh, footage from a guy who wasn't the strongest board artist. Stuff looked great. I was like, oh my God, I can't. So the guy who was really good, I couldn't wait to see, like who, whose work was really well drawn and well structured. His stuff looked like crap, <laughs> but it looked like, <laughs> but it looked like a bad version of his stuff. Yeah. You know, and it was like, I was like, oh, they just took the stuff and just like traced it off. And it's like, oh, you know, and that's what happens. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's another important lesson. Because this is an assembly line, there will be times when the stuff will come back and it'll be somewhat less than ideal. And uh, there's no way, uh, you know, especially on a TV kid, uh, a children's show budget, you know, they pad like the primetime Fox shows, they have a big pad for retakes. Right. Mm. It's designed in. Not the case on a lot of, uh, you know, no. Well, the rule of thumb with the Disney afternoon was that about a third of them are really good. A third of them were okay. And there was about a third of them that were not so good. And you figured in, in the course of 65 episodes, Yep. that the, the, the bad ones would kind of get shuffled into the good ones and the mediocre ones and nobody ever know the difference. Yep. Mm. 
Yeah. But we noticed. Well, we knew. Yeah, yeah, we, <laughs> we knew. noticed. We know. Yeah, we noticed. Yeah. But yeah, it's true. You anyway, know what are you gonna do? You know, uh, it's, uh, that's like Dave said before. It's like you get a bad animation, so you can have the best writing, the best boards, and you get an animation studio that's no good, and it just looks like shit. They just it destroy it. No, yeah. it doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. All right, so we're at nine o'clock here, uh, Pacific time, Dave. So you're uh, <laughs> here almost midnight. Oh, you know, so. Dave, this is this is the shank of the evening for me. I still have a couple hours to go. All uh, right. Yes. There's so, there's a there's a cigar and a book waiting for me yet. Well, for good. Hours, so. I I want you to enjoy <laughs> it. I can't thank you, you guys enough for for doing you know for doing this. I always I'm always um, in gratitude to you know you guys and, and talking and sharing some history with everybody so they get to hear this stuff. And um, you know at le and you're always welcome to join. I do this every Wednesday at least for a while until. You know, hopefully until this is all over, you know, it's a way to kind of chat with old friends. Yeah. It's a way to reminisce, but it's also people love hearing this stuff too. And uh, and thank you for sharing, being so gracious. Well, thank you for this. inviting us, for goodness sakes. This is a, a real pleasure. And, you know, thank you. Fact is we've all, you know, our paths have crossed so often. It's It was lovely to uh, get back in touch. You know? I hold all of you really? guys in very high esteem. And, um, Me too, Dave. You know, and so... Thanks. And Len and, and Vic, you know, it was great seeing all you guys again. You know, yeah. um, for a while there, you know, the, 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 the moving back and forth between the studios, the, the, the industry wasn't so big that, you know, if we didn't work together again on this show, the next show after that, we'd yeah. all kind of wind up back together yeah. again. Yeah. And so, you know, as the industry has kind of exploded and imploded and more and more people are filtering into it, you know, we have less and less of an opportunity that our paths cross. So, this is really wonderful um, uh, to see old, old friends that were there, you know, when, when I was kind of starting out and we kind of grew up together to a certain degree. Yes, when yeah. we all began when we were age six and we were yes. just associates, you know? <laughs> Yes, you know. Yeah, just, it's astonishing that we were able to do this at such Well, a I'm only 25 years old, but the industry <laughs> got me the white hair. Yeah. Yeah. Because, everybody, right? Yeah, everybody. Uh, let that be a lesson. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, is there is so well any, anyway just wanted to say thank you guys very very much and like i said you're always welcome if you 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 want to chat and want to bs you know we're here on wednesdays nights you Great. know where to find me so Great. i'll be happy yes. to send you the zoom link and you're always welcome to ch you know chime in and you know and and bravo so. well dave uh, the last time i saw you was at the concert that yes, and I'm wearing a wearing. shirt. I'm actually, I, you know, it, you know, Dave. It's funny because I didn't even think about it. I thought about it though when I looked at myself on the screen when we first. <laughs> and I was going to say something to you because it was the last time that I saw you. Yeah, it was the yes. yellow at the Hollywood the yellow Bowl. concert there at the Hollywood Bowl. One of the greatest uh, shows ever. That was an awesome show. And I, and I saw the Electric Light Orchestra, which is what they were called. Their first tour, which was a debacle for them. And their only hit at that point was Roll Over Beethoven. They were at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium. Uh -huh. and the opening act was Frampton's Camel. Peter Frampton before yeah. it became a big deal. <laughs> yeah. So that I saw was a them, while back. I saw them here in Cleveland. Uh, uh, they were the opening act. It was then the middle act was uh, was a young and 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 beautiful Linda Ronstadt. Wow. Oh my God. And then the big act was, oh, yeah. was Three Dog Night. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So, wow. so there you go. There's a there's a show for you. Wow! And, and but there's so people, these, probably in what so it was about five bucks, right? To get it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Wish it would go back to that. Yeah. Len, so what were you people, saying? I'm sorry, I cut you off. So, so many of these students are saying, uh, "Elector, who? Linda, what?" <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. And we are we are dating ourselves by no, saying, I, no, you know, it's like, oh, you kids and your modern music. We're you know? we're we're, we're geezing. Or you know what? You, you know what? I don't care. <laughs> that concert was that concert was one of the best concerts I ever saw. That was a great, great performance uh, yeah. at the Hollywood Bowl. I, what a perfect, perfect place to see it too. Oh, it was so good. It was so good, and it was nice to see you two out of all those thousands of people there. You know, walking by and you know, you're like, hey, you know, it was. It I know. Was I just that, that 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 was that's always the beauty of going to the Hollywood Bowl or the Greek. Yeah. Any minute you're going to bump into somebody you haven't somebody seen you know in years. Yep. You know. 
So, but I'm very happy for you, Dave. I'm glad, I'm glad that you've married your lovely wife and you got a chance to kind of retire and enjoy yourself a little bit. And, and, you know, and I'm sure your students benefit greatly from having you. I, I tell you, I have, I have these great students and, and, and just kind of thinking about the things that we're ta- you know, that we were talking about tonight, you know, and they're, they are writing and team producing their own films. And, you know, my, my seniors are getting ready to do their BFAs and they're going to be presenting the, their films that they've done themselves over the course of a year. And, you know, we've got kids yeah. that are doing CGI. I've got, a, I've got one student that's using his animation skills to make a graphics package for sports. I've got students that are doing traditional, you know, 2D animation. And it's very exciting to, right. to kind of pass on what I know to the next generation. They, they have and, to consider themselves very fortunate because they have somebody teaching them who has such, you know, who, who worked in the business. It's not like you had no, you know, you were just a guy who, who had a cup of coffee. I mean, you yeah. worked in the business. <laughs> well, everybody, so. every, actually everybody on staff there, um, uh, my, my teaching partner, uh, uh, Lincoln Adams, uh, is, uh, he's, he, he is a, you know, he's younger than I am. Mm-hmm. He's actively working from Cleveland on productions yeah. there. Uh, I've got Hal Lewis who teaches uh, CGI, uh, uh, 3D animation who work you know, Pixar and for Disney doing, you know, doing a, a, a visual, you know, 3D That's effects great. And, and animation. We've got, I mean, everybody, everybody teaching there is either, you know, is a working professional. Yeah. So, so the kids are getting firsthand in, you know, industry information and I'm thinking, are really able to, to enter the, uh, the, the industry with, you know, with, with current, direction which is going to I mean I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards doing this kind of opened my eyes to doing something maybe online because it's not fair like people that live in Brazil you know like one of the gentlemen Arthur who who was partook in in these you know lives in Brazil or lives in different parts of the country yeah um, you know it would be nice to be able to have an online class or something for those people to kind of you know just to get some of that stuff it's why I'm trying to do this even with the Zoom stuff, it's like talk, tell people that you know, you know, because you're hearing from all these people. Yeah. You, don't, you can live in Pittsburgh, in, in Cleveland. You can live in, in Iowa and get this information. Right. Well, my seniors, you know, because of our situation, uh, they were about halfway through, they, they were about halfway through the semester, you know, meeting at the, at the school. And mm. then this thing hit. So we're finishing the semester online. You know, yeah, and, right, right, and right. So it's 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 great that technology has caught up to this, so that we can actually do this. I mean, they're they are scattered all over, you know, all over sure. the country. And I'm doing my class too. I mean, I have a couple classes, and I'm doing them online. Yeah, and I'm learning. So, like you can share screens and yes, show absolutely. them stuff. And in some ways, it's almost it's better in some ways because I I can pull it right from my desktop. I'm like. Oh, you know what? Like I haven't, you know, I can show you something I did, you know, where when you're teaching, you don't have as much access to some of that stuff when you're doing a class yeah. you know, in person. So there's a part of that. I mean, I still miss the class. I still, you know, you can never approximate, you can only approximate the class people being together physically, but still it works pretty well. I still, yeah. I still like it, you know, and, um, and I, and I still think that, you know, maybe doing something online would be a fun thing to do. You know, maybe we'll even, maybe I'll talk to you about it. Maybe we can, you know, set something up and That'd be great. You know, give some thoughts or whatever. All, all I so. can say is I wish I'd known to buy stock in Zoom about six months ago. <laughs> well, you know, if you were a member of Congress, you probably did. So, you uh, know. There you yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Exactly that. Yeah. So, oh, well. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other topic I know. I mean. <laughs> so, Yeah. <laughs> I know how you guys feel, you know how I feel. So it's, yeah. yeah, but that's, it is, you know, but for sure it's, um, oh, somebody wants to know what, what university do you teach at, Dave? You teach at the Art Institute. I teach at the Cleveland Institute of Art. It's Cleveland been around Institute forever. Uh, you know, it was, it, it was a fine arts school uh, for many, many years. And I'd say probably within the last 10 years, they started integrating animation and illustration. Cool. And those are uh, out of all the art classes, uh, our, our, I mean, art curriculums, those are the two most popular, either you know, illustration, 
you know, um, um, I'm, I'm trying to nudge them <laughs> a little bit towards doing uh, comics and graphic novels. Yeah. We do some of it, but, uh, uh, and then, uh, and then the animation uh, department. Uh, is it a four-year school? This is a four-year school, yes. Mm, wow. So you get them and you have them all four years. Do you like have different classes for all four years? Or, uh... Yeah. Um, so what we do is their first year is called foundation. So basically they get a little smattering of everything. Okay. And actually next year, what we're going to do is we actually are able to now have a class or two that will be animation department specific. That's so great. They're going to be getting a little more, we're going to lean a little more heavily on uh, anatomy, perspective, you know, just the, the basic yeah. tools yeah. for illustration and animation. Sure. Uh, when, they, uh, when they come to the animation department as sophomores, um, the, 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 they'll get drawing for animation, which is kind of life drawing and, you know, how to, how to build things out of shapes and that type yeah. of thing. And then storyboarding. Okay. And then uh, as, uh, as they go into spring, they get acting and directing. Uh, this, this class I'm teaching with the sophomores, uh, uh, I'm teaching with, uh, with Lincoln Adams is called concept designs. And so they're learning how to design characters and create backgrounds. And, you know, so they're, we're, we're built, what we do is the, 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 the curriculum has been structured so that each semester builds a little bit more all geared towards their senior year when they're producing and creating their own film and they can do everything. That's awesome. And, 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 and if I can say, you know, uh, I think I saw a, uh, um, a, a question over here that said, okay, so if, so if somebody gave you a, a, a good piece of advice, what would it be? And it actually comes from a, uh, a teacher I had at the Kubert School. Who? Uh, Henry Boltonoff. Oh, I never had him. Henry Boltonoff. <laughs> Uh, uh, Henry, ba back in the in the fifties and sixties, editor wasn't he? No, his 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 brother his brother Murray Boltonoff was the Bolton. editor. Okay. But but um, but Henry was a cartoonist, and back in the fifties and sixties, DC Comics would they would they would sell half page ads for you know like grit yeah. or, or one of those yeah. things, and so they would yeah. fill it with a comic strip like Caps Hobby Shop and that type of thing. And Henry did those cartoons. Okay. Okay. So he, you know, he basically the, 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 the advice he gave me is, so Dave, learn everything you can about everything you can, because you never know where you're going to wind up. And truer words were never spoken. Um, I, you know, while, while I was doing storyboarding, I, I pushed myself to learn how to do some character design and background design. And in between gigs, when, as from storyboard gigs, yeah. I used to pick up jobs, especially at, at Deke. You know, uh, Mike Maliani would hire me to come in and do character designs for yeah. a direct video or some backgrounds or even mouth charts. And if I didn't know how to do it, I would go to Kenny Tompkins. She, oh, Kenny, show quick, quick. Show yeah. me I, I told him I know how to do mouth charts. <laughs> you know? And, and, you know, it would keep me afloat until I could get the next gig. That's, so, so yep. you know, and, and that's the other thing, too, is that when you're a director, the most successful directors are guys who have, or guys, when I say guys, I mean guys and girls, but people sure. who, who have experience doing a little bit of everything because you're able to communicate to everybody on your team. You know, you know a little bit about writing, you can have a conversation with the writers uh -huh. and, 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 and ask them things or, or tell them what you have in mind and see if they can work that into what they're doing. And, and they can talk to you about story arcs and you know where it's going. You can go and talk to your character desires and say, here's what I need out of this character because I'm gonna have them do this. You know, your background designers, and, and that, and that kind of brings me back to something that we were talking about earlier, and that is everybody's on the same page. And when everybody's on the same page, the, the episode is just going to be better. Yep. I'm a, you're, you're preaching to the choir for me. I mean, I think that it, it, there was no directing for myself. There was no greater pleasure than being able to talk to everybody and you, and you would bring story to it. The, 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 ep, lend that episode with, uh, permafrost, the, uh, um, you know, the frozen out, <laughs> we had a background designer, um, an older gentleman, and he designed a background initially that just well, didn't work. It was, a, it was her, it was her, her, hum, you know, where she lived. She was this homeless kid. Yeah. And, and 
he he initially did it was very bland and it was very and i and so we talked and i told him i said this is what the character is about it's a little girl she's you know, lost everything this room is everything to her like this is her childhood and then i showed him memories i showed him i had the art of book of memories and i showed him um there was a night really nice like the way they handled ice and 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 he came back with something that was breathtaking and it was, you know, and it was because you had, I had the opportunity to talk to him because people were like, Oh, he's just going to give you what he's going to give you. That's who he is. And I was like, bullshit. You know, the man's an accomplished artist. He knows what he's doing. And if he knows what he's doing, he can give me what I want, what I want. Yep. And sure enough, that proved my point. You know, it's all about communication yep. and that's the beauty of it. You can, like, I would go to the lend, we'd talk about story points with things, or I'd go to, you know, Alan Burnett or talk to him. There was nothing worse than when you were working with writers who weren't open to that process because you couldn't, you know, yep. if you had an idea for something, just something even little, they were, they just had the walls up and you couldn't, couldn't talk. But I, I agree with you completely. Uh, if you, if you uh, cut yourself off from other people's ideas, you're, that, that's to your disadvantage. You don't get to, um, you know, uh, benefit from other person's experiences, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, you know, it's true. And I think a curious mind, like I think that, that you have to have a curious mind and you have to want to push yourself. And it is good advice. Somebody wrote here, bold enough, the cartoonist from the fifties. <laughs> <laughs> That's the guy. Yeah. That's the guy, you know, yeah. and, 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 you know, a lot of the, a lot of the young Turks strutting around there thought, you know, Oh, he's, he's, old he old. doesn't know what he's talking about you know that's not yeah. that's not the way it is today yeah. you know bullshit yeah bullshit <laughs> you know that's that yeah. piece of advice just travels from generation yep. to generation to generation yep. and is proved solid every time well one of the things i found amazing i i never had eisner for a teacher but one of my contemporaries did when we were when i was at the cupid school eisner was teaching at sva yeah my friend had him for a teacher and he he worshipped Eisner, you know, that was our that was kind of our common ground. But he said most of the students there made fun of him and they thought that he was, yeah. you know, because everybody wanted to draw image comics, you know, and it's like yep. Yeah. That you ain't know, it. Well, you know, know, I used to go down the SVA. Well, the thing is is that um because I knew Will, I was always hawking him to do me a spirit sketch. And yeah. he would always kind of go, Okay, I'll do it. And then we would just run out of time. So he, said, <laughs> so he would go, well, you know, next time you're in, in town, come on down to SVA. So I would go down to SVA thinking, okay, you know, I'll catch him. He'll, he'll do me a quick right. sketch. And he'd go, well, you know, Dave, as long as you're here, why don't you talk to the class about, you know, what it's like to be a uh, freelance, you know, uh, you know, schlepping your portfolio around to the, you know, and then, so he'd get me going. I'd answer questions and I looked around and go, Where's Will? You know, <laughs> you know, and then we'd always kind of run out. We'd always, finally, I cornered him, but 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 you know, uh, uh, and I know that, that people kind of looked at him as being you know old timey, but boy, I tell you, you know, there was just his when in his prime, and well, even even not, even when he wasn't doing the spirit, when he was doing you know a contract with God or uh, that yeah. type of thing, I mean. Oh my God. I mean, here's this guy who, who, you know, you see him on the street and you, you're not even going to think that this is, this guy is, if, if he's not the father of graphic novels, he's, he's, he's pretty damn close, you know? Uh, you know, it's good is good. I mean, great is great. And I don't care if it was, you know, there's people that look at the movies, the silent era and make fun of it. And it's like, are you kidding me? Like that stuff is as innovative today. I, if not more so. I always tell the students to spend some time watching silent films because sure. uh, because it was all visual communication. They had no they had no limitations either. Yeah. They didn't have to worry about microphones or anything getting in the well, way. Well, there was and there was a there was a language barrier. Yes. You know, but yeah. but the silent movies could travel anywhere. Yep. And it was all in the acting and the emotion. And if you study that, you know, you're you're going to get those good animation poses. Well, see, not only that, but also some of the some of the camera stuff that they did it was so elaborate. It's mind boggling how there's a there was a one I forget which film which silent movie it came from, but it was like a it was a tracking shot and it was going underneath like car you know carriages going over top of things as elaborate as anything you would see in a CG you know with CG. I, I think today. that might have been it might have been the crowd. 
It was the crowd. That's yeah. what it was. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it goes one. up, it go, kind of goes up the side of a building. It goes right. through the window right. into an office right. building. Yep. Right. Yeah. I mean, how ingenious is that? Well, <laughs> uh, also uh, uh, Abel Gans Napoleon with all the yeah. multiple screens and the, the color filters. And you kind of go, you know, if, if I always think if, if sound hadn't come in when it did, how much further the industry would have been, yeah. you know, uh, if it waited even a little bit it longer. It would have retarded the process for sure. You know, they had, they had the, then they were limited by where they could put the microphones and how yeah. far the actors could be. And it, it really hurt the process. So, yeah. And so, I mean, I always tell my students that, you know, it's, we're still in its infancy. I mean, filmmaking is still, so to think that somebody is old or that's old, it's like, no, <laughs> it's not like, you know, the language of cinema or the language of storytelling is pretty universal. And yeah. it's, uh, and you know, good is good. There's, yeah. there's, I don't care what, how long ago it was that you saw it. It doesn't matter. I'll tell him, show me the scene that turns you on and I'll show you the guy who influenced him <laughs> to get that shot. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Yep. Absolutely. 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 Hey Dave, one, one, one more question for you. Yeah. Because the person lives in Ohio, they want to know if there's a master's program. Um, there, it, there isn't that kind of undergrad master's kind of setup. Um, it, basically, it's just a four-year program. Okay. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's kind of the best. Uh, but you know what? Um, if uh, whoever here is a, is a trend that's yeah, uh, sure. uh, in Ohio, uh, if you go to the Cleveland Institute of Art website, uh, I think you can you can find my name and an email address for me, and you can drop me a line there, and you can ask more specific questions. And if I don't know, I'll I'll know who to ask and get you the answer. That's very you know, gracious that's of you. And then um, Dee had one about any tips for a portfolio to, to for a high school senior to get in. Well, you know the thing, uh, like okay, so with the Cleveland Institute of Art, they have a, actually they have a they have a summer program for high school seniors that are thinking that they might want to go there. It's like a two week go. crash course and you get, you get a little bit of everything. You, you, you do a little animating, you do, you know, um, you know, the thing that, uh, uh, the, the, so the thing that I look for when I'm, uh, uh, because we, we usually interview the freshmen that are interested in going into animation and we take a look at what they've done in their, that foundation year. And, um, uh, sketchbooks. I look at we look at sketchbooks because that's when they're the freest and they're they're not, you know, they're they're throwing down their ideas in a loose form. They're not trying to impress yeah. anybody with a drawing. Yeah. Um, I don't want to. I wouldn't want to see. Uh, I wouldn't want to see you show me a copy of somebody else's stuff or or you know, pull out the you know get, get yourself a wall, water a Walter Foster book on animation and then give me a page of. Walter Foster type characters. I want to see what you can do. I want to be able to see how you think. I'll, you know, I'll train you how to put those skills to work and get your idea out. I want to see how you think, how you process information and how you try and make it work. One, one of my best friends is a, uh, left from Los Angeles and he worked, I worked with him at Cartoon Network and he's had a story up at Pixar He's been up there for a number of years now. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he told me, you know, we've talked about this with students and this question always comes up. And he said, Pixar, the same advice you gave. They, they're never looking at, they won't look at a TV storyboard. You know, if I, if I went up there and showed them, oh, here's Spider-Man. They're like, oh, that's great. <laughs> where's your stuff? Like, where's yeah. the story? Yeah. Where's, your, where's your personal work? That's always what they want to see is how you a personal work means a lot more to them than, than something that is just, you know, taken from a standard production with model sheets. And you know, the funny that. thing is though, and, and, and uh, Vic, Dave, tell me if, if you know any different, I always found that storyboard guys from features had a really difficult time working in television. Oh, yeah. but True. television yes. guys, but television guys could, could not only, not only jump <coughs> on the features, but get it done in a fraction of the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When yeah. I worked on how to train your dragon, Dave, what, what had happened, um, we were, all the TV guys were there and they had loan outs from DreamWorks who would show, who would come and show up. Right. Every one of those guys 
couldn't do it. They couldn't uh-huh. hack it. Yep. And Sandy Rabin, who was the producer, she was, she was Spielberg's right hand person at one time. She was running the show. And, she, and I like Sandy. She came over to me and she said, I want to tell you something. She said, we had a preconceived notion of TV storyboard people when we started this project. We felt that you would probably be the weak link. And, you know, and she said, nothing could have been further from the truth. She Absolutely. said, thank God we had you. You guys were the ones who saved the show. You guys were the ones who came in and did the work on not only on deadline, but also you know, you were like machines and and the ideas that you would just generate. And, you know, I'd watch guys come in from feature. They struggled constantly. They couldn't handle Uh the schedule. It was always a schedule. They, (laughs) their process was different. They were used to sitting on, on, on a section of script for weeks and revisiting it and revisiting it and revisiting it where we're like, you got to hit that moment. And it's like, you don't have time to, yeah. I know when I worked on uh, I worked on that directive video uh, uh, Mickey Goofy Donald the Three Musketeers yeah I was I was between shows and so they loaned me out to that and so I sat down with the director and he goes well so we've got this opening sequence and um, uh, so uh, we're gonna have you board that and it's like a page and a half right and he goes now I, I can only give you five weeks to work on it. Do you think, do you think you can get it done in five weeks? I'm, you know, and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, dude, I can bang this out in five hours. I mean, I, you know, it's You're five like, hours. Woo-hoo. Yeah. Five hours. And then four and a half weeks of doing nothing. You know? yeah. yeah. It'll be good. It'll be good though. But the thing is, it'll be really good. It won't yeah. be some hacked out piece of shit. It'll be T- really good. Because, because yeah. TV teaches you, you know, that's, that's the other thing about TV storyboard is that that because of the way because of the way we had to work with the schedule so we had to learn how to make quick decisions and get them down on paper which trained us to be directors yeah mm. because we could solve yeah, we could problem solve very quickly you have to be a quick you have to be a pro you have to embrace that very quickly and that's what i mean like the perfect can't be the enemy of the good like you have there's times where it's like look uh, this is going to work yeah. i'll get back to it if i can if it doesn't then it's going to stay where it is you know yep. and you just have to keep that's the concessions that you learn how to make. And the thing is, is sometimes when you revisit it, you're like, well, I don't know why I was so hung up on this. This works really well. It's a great idea. I you know. know, I know. Yeah, Absolutely. It's the, yeah that's sometimes a, the uh, impetus, uh, you know, you've got to turn it in in a quick fashion. Sometimes that is to your advantage. You can't sit and stew on it. You actually have to sort of use your training and your talent and gut instincts to make this happen quickly. Yeah. I mean, you know, writing a television episode in a week as compared to having the luxury of writing, you know, the equivalent of, uh, you know, a screenplay. If you, if you have to turn out a, a, a script a week in three weeks as compared to six months to do a screenplay or a year, uh, you got to be pretty on your game straight off the, or straight out of the, the, the book box just to get it done, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. because there's somebody at the other end who needs to start boarding it or recording it or any of that stuff. Yep. So it's very handy to, you know, be, have the training and also to, you know, be able to sort of get in there and get her done. It's true. Yeah. Uh, all right. On that note, we went through the bonus round. So <laughs> another okay. half hour we later. Everyone to sleep. So Dave, so Dave, everybody's gone now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> everybody's gone. Um, so now we can really, really talk. Now Everybody's going to really sleep talk. really good tonight because we just lulled them into a, <laughs> a coma. <laughs> well, Dave, you only have an hour and a half now to get the cigar and the uh, and the drink. So, uh, yeah, you know, thanks. <laughs> well, no. All right. Well, like it's I said, nice. it's great. It's actually, it's really nice talking to you guys. So if you, you know, you want something to do, you want to kill some time, you want to BS, you know, you know where to find me. So Absolutely. Uh, send me a thing. Thank, and, thank uh, you, David, for including us. It was really a pleasure. Thank it you, guys. Are you kidding? Oh, no, my pleasure was all mine. I had a great time. The, the company was, was, was great. It really was. I agree. It's always, it's always enjoyable, and it's nice to have such great guys who, you know, who are willing to share all their stuff. So, so next time, we should all have a, bo- have, a, have a glass of scotch in front of that us. That sounds like a good idea. We'll, we'll so we make can... a drink and talk. And then, the, and then all of the stuff will come. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Then, <laughs> then, Len, Len, then, then we will name the name of the guy who is running this <laughs> 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 And also, you know, 
I will have to learn to drink at this late stage. So, uh, I look to you guys for guidance. So. <laughs> All right. All right, gentlemen, have a wonderful night. Stay safe. Stay Thanks. healthy. You, you too. Healthy. Thank you. Too. Thank and you. I, I look forward. Thanks. I look forward to seeing all you guys again. And yeah, thanks, we'll do it soon. Thanks for hanging in there with us. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. See you guys. Have a wonderful night. Good, Good night. Day. Thank thanks you. Thanks a lot. Good night. Thank Bye. You. Good night.